Good evening. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alexander Leach. I am the Senior Education Manager for ACCA based in the Middle East. And I will be taking you for the next five evenings through a practice to pass ACCA webinar series for strategic business leader. Um, before we move on and sort of get into the actual presentation I just wanted to sort of do a little bit of an introduction and also a little bit of housekeeping for anybody who's using the system for the first time including myself um, you will hopefully be on the go to webinar panel and you will hopefully be able to hear me and if you can hear me what I would like you to do is you will have a questions section and if you could just put a little yes um, or a little why in the question section. I believe currently we have around 70 attendees, so I'll make sure the majority of us can hear me. Um, and if you have any technical issues as we go along, um, I have a colleague logged on called Kishore. He will be able to assist with those. And um, realistically, hopefully you shouldn't have any problems. So I'm just waiting for a few um, yeses uh, in the question panel. There we go, Hussein, Erica. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, keep them coming. I'm, I'm more than more than happy to see them flying in and we will start in all of about 60 seconds. I just want to make sure everyone is ready to go. Right then guys, so that's probably enough time to make sure that most people can hear me. Um, I'll move through the presentation and give you a bit of an overview. As we progress, if you do have any questions relating to the actual exam itself, so non-tech questions, you know, anybody who's got a problem with their IT, unfortunately I can't do anything from that from Dubai, but I'm sure Kishore can from Pakistan. Um, but anybody who's got a, a question about the specifics, throw it into, hi Waleed, thank you very much. Anybody who's got any questions regarding the actual syllabus or the things we are discussing, pop them in the question panel and I'll address them as we go along. I might not address them immediately. Um, it might be that we take a pause and then I address them as we go along. And yes, um, the information will be shared in terms of handouts. So there is a handout section for every evening and currently in the handout section for this evening, we have the presentation slides and we have a few articles as well that ACCA have created. So the overview for this evening, um, I'll do an introduction and I generally do like to talk about myself, probably a little bit too much, so I'll try and keep it um, as, as concise as possible. Um, and I hope that, you know, I had a little bit of um, a little bit of trust as we go along and that you're able to, to sort of converse with me. I want you to engage a lot with, with these sessions. So the question panel will be active. We will be doing some forms of quizzes, engagement through quizzes. So I want to try and make it as, uh, as, as, as fun as possible because I'm a firm believer that if you're having fun, it makes the learning a lot easier. This evening, I'll be talking about the strategic professional level and I'll be going into a little bit on the ethics and professional skills module and how that can complement and support you and help you with your exams in the strategic professional level, including SBL. I'll then be going into some detail on the strategic business leader paper and I'll be talking about study tips, exam techniques, how to approach the actual exam, and then I'll be spending quite some time talking about examiner's report debriefs. I'll then go into a summary of what we've done this entire evening, and then I'll give you a little bit of an overview or an outline of a case study called RealCo, which is what we'll be looking at tomorrow evening. So as I said, um, I, do, I, I do like to talk about myself, but I will try and keep this as concise as possible. Um, I am Alexander Leach and I am the Senior Education Manager for the ACCA and this is pretty much my background. I am an ACCA member. Um, I was fortunate enough to qualify with PricewaterhouseCoopers um, based in London and in Hull, which is in the north of England. 
I then, after some time, decided to move into the education sector and I joined Kaplan Financial, which many of you may or may not be aware of, um, which is a platinum provider for the ACCA qualification. I taught at Kaplan for um, around four years, teaching an array of, of topics, um, predominantly focusing on the case study based papers like Strategic Business Leader, um, but I was also heavily involved in the transition of SBL with ACCA because I used to teach the predecessors, which was P1, so Corporate Governance, Risk and Ethics, along with uh, P3, which was the Business Strategy type paper. Um, in addition to my role at Kaplan Financial, I was the president and vice president, um, moved from vice president to president, of a chartered account society in the north of England called LCAS. My exposure on all of these experiences gave me really great understanding of ACCA and the challenges facing its students and, not to add, all other qualifications within my remit as a chartered accountant. Now, that's my general background from a career progression point of view. Feel free uh, to, to do a little bit of uh, a LinkedIn stalking, or for a better expression, and add me on LinkedIn. Um, you can always get in touch that way as well if you, feel, if you feel you need to ask me any questions, and I can always do my best to get back in touch and support you with that. Um, so yeah, that's that's really it. Um, and if you do have any other questions about my background and how I've sort of moved through and what I do now, feel free to fire me a message. For the overview of these five evenings, they will start at 7 p.m. Uh, Pakistan time and they will finish at 10 p.m. and they will continue for the next five evenings. This evening, evening one, we are going to have an overview of the strategic professional level talk specifically about strategic business leader, because why else would you be here? I've done my introduction, so we can tick that one off, and I'm a big fan of um, ticking things off. I think it's a prerequisite of being an accountant. You like to be methodical. Uh, we'll talk about EPSM. I'll talk about study tips, exam techniques, how to approach the strategic business leader paper. I'll go through examiners report debriefs, and then I'll outline real code. For tomorrow evening and the evening after that, we will be going through specimen paper two, which you will be able to get access to on the ACCA's website, but also will be a handout. Now, if I'm being completely transparent with you, I would expect all of you to download that exam, read it before tomorrow's session. Because if you haven't already, if you went in and came to the session tomorrow without reading that exam, you would be considerably rushing through that paper, trying to get the most out of the content which we will be going through. And likewise, evenings four and evenings five, we will be going through an exam script called Highlight, which was December 2018's exam. So a year passed since the one you're about to sit and we'll be doing what we call exam walkthroughs. Now, an exam walkthrough is slightly different to maybe what you might be used to from a typical sort of revision session with maybe your own training providers. In other exams, you can take pieces out of the exam, for example, maybe advanced taxation, and do a question specifically related to inheritance tax or capital gains tax which is perfectly fine. Whereas with Strategic Business Leader, because it is a leadership exam focused around professionalism, it is much harder to take individual segments of the script. You need to walk through the exam from start to finish, more often than not very chronologically on a timeline, because that's the way the exam is structured. Therefore, we'll be doing exam walkthroughs. Um, I will be talking through where and how to dissect the questions, what to actually guide you in terms of mark allocation, key verbs, structure, where to find the information in the exhibits, and predominantly trying to give you something through the eyes of, of an examiner, of a tutor, and a marker. Before I get into the ethics and professional skills module, what I will do is I'll just have a little quick look in my questions panel, which currently doesn't seem too full and I can see uh, an odd few questions, uh, nothing that I'd need to necessarily answer immediately. Everybody being very, very, well, very nice saying hello 
um, talking about a WhatsApp page, which sounds really exciting. So if uh, at the end of the session, I'll have a read through about that and maybe I'll have to get, get that set up. But it looks like everyone's up and running. Oh, and the attendees have increased as well. We've got around 100 people online now, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, what I'll do now is I'll get, excuse me, I'll get stuck into my conversation around ethics and professional skills. Now, generally speaking, students have previously, with the old ethics module, often left it till the end. And they've done that because they've worked through their, their individual uh, modules, individual exams, and they've decided, oh, I'll do that at the end when I want to stand up for my actual qualification and get membership. Well, we've designed the ethics and professional skills module now in such a way that it should actually assist you with all of your exams at the strategic professional level. And what's really good about it is it's an interactive module it's not something like a particular study module where you would go through it and you have to do it in a certain amount of time. I mean, yes, there is a time um, guideline, but it's flexible. It's meant to try and fit around your life. And it's designed to upskill you and give you the professional understanding to attack the strategic professional level. And it is extremely helpful when it comes to strategic professional leadership paper. So this is what it looks like. Um, and it's got little guides, it's got little circles which you can go around and see how much you're progressing through it. And the contents wise ranges from ethics and professionalism, uh, personal effectiveness, innovation and scepticism, commercial awareness, leadership and team working, communication and interpersonal skills, data analytics, strategic, um, strategic, that again, strategic professional support unit, and then the end of module assessment. Now, I would hugely advocate, if you haven't already, doing the EPSM module as soon as possible. It will sincerely help you with your studies and is extremely helpful when it comes to the SBL paper. You often, well, you often, you will receive a certificate award once completing it, and the guideline duration is approximately 20 hours. But having said that, I've had students who've done it in, you know, less than that. Some do it in 16, and also some do it in more time as well. But it's not a continuous 20 hours. You don't have to stay awake all evening to do it. You can do it over the course of a few evenings. So into the actual main of, well, the main reason you're here um, and into the strategic professional level of this presentation. This is your standard overview of ACCA and I am assuming, hopefully correctly, that most people will be now in this nice blue section, the strategic professional level. And you've got your essentials and you've got your option papers. And as you will hopefully be aware, the strategic business leader paper, the SBL paper, is an essential module. Um, we also have the strategic business reporting paper, which I believe there may be some practice to pass webinars going on around that. And then we have the optional papers, which some of you may have already done. You've got advanced auditing, uh, advanced taxation, advanced performance management and advanced financial management. Just to sort of give you an overview, if you aren't too familiar with this level, um, you only have to pick two of the options, whereas you have to do the two essentials of SBL and SBR. We've already really talked about the ethics and professional skills module and how it complements the essentials and the options. And the main, the, main, the main focus of the entire evening sessions that we'll be doing is all around SBL. Having said that, some of you may be studying other papers, so that's completely admirable. And hopefully you will have the support necessary, maybe through an approved learning partner, or maybe you're doing self-study, and I wish you all the best on those other optional papers or the other essential paper. Strategic business leader. This exam is the, well, a significantly sized exam um, with a massive syllabus. Um, we can't really hide from it and we've got to completely address this. It is a considerable syllabus. Now I'll probably spend a little bit of time now just talking through whilst on this slide the different areas of the syllabus which are in white and then the professional skills which are in red. As you can see it ranges from leadership, 
governance, you've got strategy, risk, technology and data analytics, organisational control and audit, financing, planning and decision making, and then we've got innovation, performance, excellence and change management. Now, many of you may or may not be familiar with the old exams, and I won't dwell on them too much, but this syllabus is designed as a, as a sort of gateway or a bridge between the P1 and P3 exams. And when the ACCA actually announced they were going to be delivering this exam and, and creating the SBL exam, I, for one, was extremely happy about it. Not only is it a by far more innovative exam, um, and more actual relevant than two separate exams, it really does complement how things like risk, how things like risk and strategy or governance and leadership overlap with one another. And it allows you naturally to show your professionalism and leadership skills in an academic and professional context. On top of that, the introduction of a significant amount of professional qualification marks or professional skills marks within the qualification identifies and highlights what ACCA is trying to produce by students who are sitting the SPL exam. We are trying to produce leaders. The, the, the need now within the accountancy profession for somebody who can do debits and credits is somewhat diminishing. We are trying to create the leaders of tomorrow, the accountants of the future with the skill set that is required by employers now. So if we talk through each one, and maybe I'll give you a little bit of a sort of insight as to what it's covered, um, and we'll start logically with leadership. So within the leadership syllabus area, we, or you should be aware of different leadership styles and how leadership maybe differs from management and also different approaches to leadership and how that affects such things as organisational structure which generally complements really nicely into governance. Now, governance is just a big word or a big area of the syllabus which is related to the oversight of an organisation. So within governance, we might look at things like board structures. Um, you may also look at things like non-for-profit structures, uh, directors and non-executive directors, and how a, a company or an organisation is controlled in the interest of all its stakeholders. So not just shareholders, stakeholders. So anybody who has an interest or can be affected or have an effect upon an organization. We also have a section within the syllabus on strategy, which is extremely um, interesting. And many students often engage with this. Um, and it looks at how businesses want to move towards with a future vision. So how organisations might move in the long term, in fact, it's very much long term focused strategy and how a business might compete. So you might be familiar with different models or different frameworks and how strategies fit into such things as the models and frameworks. We also have the risk section of the syllabus. Now, risk is actually a very interesting part of an accountant's job, and many of you might even work in areas like risk management. And within the SBL context, you look at a case study and try and identify key risks, and there could be strategic risks, so they overlap, or there could be operational risks at the lower level of an organization, or even tactical risks within the middle of the organization. Now, risks as a, a general word are things that require control. And control, again, links back to governance. So you can see how the syllabus areas do overlap. And the types of requirements that you might be expected to do are the things that a risk manager or somebody who works for a risk committee within a business would be expected to do in real life. It might be identify a risk and provide a recommendation for a company which the case study is centered around. One of the other syllabus areas includes technology and data analytics, which is our way of creating a current affairs section and making the qualification of the exam extremely relevant. Um, there may be elements within your exam that cover the, the implementation of technology. So how you would implement things like cloud computing, or it might be even things along the lines of cryptocurrency or blockchain. And then that links into elements like data analytics, where you would be expected to take 
a set of information may be produced as a result of technology implementation and analyze it using your professional insights. The next section, organizational control and audit. This plays a key part within all organizations, how you control something and how it overlaps into the audit function. Now controls and risk very much interlink. You would potentially get a requirement that asks you to find a risk and then come up with an internal control. Internal controls are a network of systems um, to reduce risks or to reduce potential issues and provide reasonable assurance that an organization will attain its objectives. And an audit complements that. And you may need to look at it from a perspective of an internal auditor or even an external auditor or an audit committee. Within the SPL exam, we have a syllabus area on the finance or financial planning and decision making. And this is where your knowledge from financial management, and I'm going to talk and, and emphasize the, the importance of the underpinning knowledge that is assumed that you will have when taking the SBL exam, because it is a strategic professional level exam, it is assumed that you will have knowledge at the level of the oh, sort out that again of a strategic professional. So you will have studied or have exemptions for studying up to the applied skills level. So in, within that includes things like financial planning and decision making. So you might be asked to do an appraisal on a set of financial information. So that could be looking at profitability or cost accounting, or it could be doing something even a little bit more interesting or a little bit more exciting, like trying to do an appraisal for value for money. And then you've got to take the, the hat, one for a better expression or the, the, the point of view of a director maybe, and make a decision on things like investment. So you require understandings of internal rates of return, net present value. Um, payback and other investment criteria. The last white box is innovation, performance excellence and change management. Leadership skills are often required within an organization at all levels when there is change needed. And this is a relatively innovative area of a syllabus for any academic professional qualification. And this can be included within the SBL exam by you showing that you understand how to manage change and even how to implement change and understanding the different types of change within an organization, whether they're affected by different paces of change, the extent of change, and then mapping out what type of change is occurring or requires to happen. We then have the red blocks. So we've got communication, commercial acumen, analysis, skepticism, and evaluation. These are the professional skills. And what's wonderful about the strategic business leader exam is that you have 20 marks for this area of the syllabus, for 20 marks, which I genuinely believe are, are sure and emphasize the significance of being a professional by showing you can communicate, you do have commercial acumen, you show analysis skills, you illustrate skepticism, and you can provide a good evaluation of a scenario. Now, we will be going into specific examples of each one of, one of these, but just to give you an overview, as I did with each area of the syllabus from a, a technical point of view, I'll start with communication. As I said, the SBL exam is, a, is an integrated case study, an innovative paper that wants to try and develop the skill set of the leaders and the accountants that the world needs in the future and now. And we need accountants who can communicate. So you must be able to illustrate that you can communicate within this exam, because it's all well and good being an absolute technical wizard at international accounting standards, but if you can't tell anybody what they mean within the different areas of the organization, it's not always the most useful and effective professional to be. So within the exam, if you're asked to produce a, a good element of communication, the examiner will be looking at how you presented your answer. So if they asked you to produce a report, produce a report. If they asked you to produce a letter, produce a letter. 
a memo, produce presentation slides, draw a heat map. Make sure that you take the instruction that the requirement is setting and don't just write in a, um, a typical academic way of an essay, which is maybe what you might be used to from your previous studies. Your communication skills show that you can actually take instruction and, and target an audience. You also need to consider the audience. If you are writing to a subordinate compared to the chief executive officer or a client, you will need to communicate in a different way, in a different language pattern and so forth. Commercial acumen is an extremely valuable professional skill. And I often explain to my students that commercial acumen is the ability to look outside of the box and outside of what's in front of you and have a wider understanding of macroeconomical and macro environmental factors that affect organizations and industries today. Commercial acumen is the ability to draw upon your experience and further reading and just try and take a broader horizon and a broader understanding. So rather than just looking at a set of financial information in front of you, you want to be using all of the exhibits in the case study to try and draw your knowledge from each element of the exhibit that might have an impact. So it might be things like having an understanding of a political or economical, social, technological, legal and environmental impacts on a business, on an organization or on an individual. A pastel model is often one that helps you broaden your understanding of different commercial aspects. But it's not just pastel, it could also link back to things like um, cost accounting, interest rates, inflation, political stability. The next professional skill is analysis. Now, the analysis skill is something that a, a, a very, very good accountant should be extremely competent in. We naturally are quite analytical people. We like to take a situation and look behind maybe the, the obvious, try and find a cause and effect. And the types of requirements that ask you to analyze within a strategic professional leadership and a strategic business leadership exam are the types of requirements which maybe give you some numerics. So they could give you a data set. It might be a set of financial statements. It might be a set of management accounts. It might even be a spreadsheet from an Excel extract that somebody else has prepared. And you have to analyze the information as well as understanding the scenario and the case study to then draw some forms of conclusions. So you could do some numbers and then your answer and the mark allocation, not only technical but also professional, will come from being able to add some form of comment which would be a so what type comment through cause and effect. So profit has increased by X percent. This is as a result of, I don't know, a reduction in costs because we are now importing from another country which has a lower overhead. This as a result has allowed us to reduce our, our actual sales price and linking it into things like price elasticity of demand. So your analysis is thinking very much like an accountant and very much from a cause and effect and giving a strategic professional answer. The last two, we've got scepticism. So I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about scepticism. And this is a brilliant professional skill for anybody in, in chartered accountancy and anybody working in any professional services sector. Being skeptical is not a bad thing. In fact, it's a good thing. And being skeptical is not to distrust anybody or any information that you are given. It is often practiced more so or emphasized more so in audit papers. So if you've previously sat audit and assurance or you work in an audit sector, or even you might have sat your optional advanced audit and assurance paper, or you went to a university, you got an exemption and you studied auditing there, they will have talked about professional scepticism. Well, I hope they talked or you studied about professional scepticism. Because that underpins the questioning mind that we require in our profession. We would not be given a set of data or a managerial assertion without actually wanting to understand whether it was trustworthy. 
So within your exam, you may be asked to illustrate professional skepticism or skepticism as a professional skill, and you need to show the examiner in your answer that you question. And it is quite simple to show that. Question the assertions of the directors or the information and its validity. The last one is ironically, or maybe ironically is the wrong word, um, is is importantly the one that students suffer with the most in my experience and it's the ability to evaluate so i like to simplify this as much as i can if you are asked to give an evaluation you are asked to weigh up both sides of an argument and it might well be that your personal opinion is one that favors an outcome that is strongly in your own beliefs or strongly in the interest of the business but to show evaluation you've got to be able to actually illustrate to the examiner that you can argue both sides irrespective of your own personal opinion this is now a professional opinion so you need to be able to give arguments to and for or against to and against uh, for and against even different parts of a business's plan and you often see evaluation verbs or evaluation questions when trying to make or trying to evaluate business decisions. So it may be whether to invest in a certain country, it may be whether to invest in a certain product or service, or it may be to evaluate certain candidates and their personal specification and their abilities. So to simplify evaluation, you must be able to argue both sides and then conclude and once you can do that, you are showing the examiner that you can evaluate. So I spent quite a little bit of time there talking about the syllabus areas and the skills that are required within the strategic business leader exam. And now I'm gonna talk through the exam, but I'll flick through to my next slide. And this is what the exam looks like. Now, hopefully you can see this um, and you can see that it's a, you know, a, nice, a nice typical ACCA exam. Just bear with me one second while I check question panel to see if there's anything that I need to answer imminently. Hello, ladies and gents, I've not ran off yet. I'm just making sure I can have a read through these re questions. So let me start at, um, there we go. So Ibrahim, the question you asked me earlier, are you the examiner for SBL? Ibrahim, I wish I was, um, but no, I am not the examiner for SBL. Um, and I can delete that one. What else have we got going on? Um, I've got a question which I can't get the full question for, bear with me one second. If I can grab that. Uh, which one? Is it advisable to do, uh, Aman, or oh, Amma, thank you. Is it advisable to do both APM and SBL together? Um, in all honesty, no, it is not. Uh, they do complement one another, and it does depend on a varying amount of personal circumstances, but as a general rule, I would argue not to combine too many papers. What else have we got in here? Right then, um, I will get stuck back into the presentation. And as we go along, uh, are we going through uh, with most of the topics of the SPL syllabus or must specific? Um, 
Aisha, I might need you to reword that question. Let me just try and get my head around it. Are we going through with most of the topics of SBL syllabus or must be specific? So this webinar series is very much assuming or focusing around that you will have already done some pre-study. So we won't be going into every area of the syllabus specifically. I've done a, a large overview about five minutes ago. So it isn't going to be tuition led. It's very much going to be walkthrough revision led. Uh, I believe the question, um, Abdul Qadir, thank you very much. I believe that relates to, I've done it last April, so would it be necessary to go back and revise it again, sir? I am assuming you relate this to the ethics and professional skills module. Uh, so with that being said, I would say it does not hurt to revisit it, although you would not need to go through and do it all again. Brilliant, and I see a bit of conversation around um, different areas of the professional skills. Um, are there any new articles preparing the new syllabus? Um, so this is a question from Abdul Qadir again, I believe. Yeah, are there any new articles pertaining to the new syllabus being added to the paper? There are an absolute plethora of articles um, and I'm going to go through the ACCA resources this evening um, so hopefully you'll be able to get a bit of direction from me as to what you'll need to read. Um, what else have we got? A little bit more about WhatsApp group. Right then, I'll come back to any more of the questions so I'm more than happy to do that but I'll get stuck into, as I was going to, the exam itself. So the exam itself um, which you've probably seen on the screen from the PowerPoint slide, is a four-hour exam. And you will probably think initially, oh, that's quite long. And I don't blame you for thinking that, because four hours can be seen or can come across quite daunting as an exam or as a time period to sit into an exam hall. What I will say is that actually you're saving over two, what, two and a half hours? Because previously it was two separate exams and they were three hours and 15 minutes together and that's six and a half hours. So you're actually having to do one less exam and you're only having to do an exam for 45 minutes longer than you would normally previously. And what's good about this is that the four, four hour exam, actually, I will teach you and talk you how to structure your time within that exam to make sure you get the most use of it. Many students often feedback that they would like even more time in the exam because it's very much trying to create a bit of a work work environment, a bit of a scenario based around work. And four hours in the office, you probably will find is you might not get everything done you need to. So time management is key as it is with most exams in the ACCA. 100 marks, 80 of them are technical and 20 are professional skills. And we've talked about what the, the professional skills are already. Lovely 50% or 50, not 50%, 50% pass mark, 50 mark to pass. Um, and it generally is, um, is often quite a nice thing to sort of see that students often hit quite a lot higher than that. 12 pages of case study, if not more, some exams go up to 16. All the questions are based around the same scenario. So unlike any other exam where you might have um, different scenarios. So I know that in strategic business reporting, there's two sections and those two sections have different scenarios. This exam just has one big case study that all the questions are based around that scenario. And the emphasis of this exam is on a combination of technical and professional skills. They are not um, independent of one another. In fact, they are positively correlated. So what I mean by that is if you score well and produce an answer with good technical knowledge and you structure it in a way and you address the professional skills requirement, they go hand in hand. So they go up together, they correlate. So somebody scoring well on a technical will also more often than not score well on a professional skills mark as well.
Typical exam tasks, this is what they look like, and this is one actually we will be going through over the course of the next five evenings. So they might ask you to produce some form of data analysis, or start data analysis of a spreadsheet and then interpret it. Now you can have a read through this requirement. I'm not going to spend too much time because we will be going through it, but this is just so you get a taste for what it looks like. So it is now three months later, it gives you a timeline. A new chief executive has been appointed and is working closely with the board of directors of Railco uh, Trust Board to improve performance. So it gives you a little bit of a scenario timeline walkthrough. And then the requirement, this is requirement four, tells you your role within the scenario. You are an internal auditor working for the Audit and Risk Committee of Railco. So look, you've just got a new job, which is fantastic. And that will also play a level of importance into how you answer the requirement. The new chief executive asked the financial controller of Railco to produce a spreadsheet which analyzes the ticket sales and rail usage by station within the Beeland Rail Network and which also analyzes the estimated levels of fraud occurring across the Railco Network. And again, we will be doing this requirement, but I just want to talk through it quickly. It's now setting the scene even more so and building on. So the chief exec has asked for this uh, of the financial controller because they've produced a particular report. Your job, and remember your job is an internal auditor, you are asked by the chair of the audit and risk committee to review the findings of the financial controller and present a report. Oh, look, it's telling you what it wants you to present, which is a report which requires you to do the following. And this is only part A. Analyze the information presented in the spreadsheet produced by the financial controller, questioning any assumptions made uh, that they, he has made and explain the implications of the findings to Railco or for Railco. And then you've got the mark allocation, eight marks, and then the professional skills are awarded for skepticism. Now, if I was going to be saying, right, let's spend 10 minutes now pulling this question apart and trying to actually answer it, um, which we will be doing actually over the next evening or next two evenings, I would be saying, right, who are you? What's the requirements key verb analyze? What information are you going to be looking at? You're going to be looking at a spreadsheet produced by a financial controller. Who is your audience and how long should you be spending on it? Well, that will depend on the mark allocation. Other typical exam tasks or the typical requirements. So you've already seen data analysis of a spreadsheet and then interpreting this. But you could also be asked to analyze and use visual aids such as heat maps, flow charts, process maps problem identification and resolution, uh, making supporting recommendations, drafting reports, memos, letters, articles, and other forms of written business communication. And that's why it's so important that you are aware of what a memo or a report or a letter or an article actually look like, because you may get asked to produce them. You can also be asked to produce press releases or even presentation slides, which is the last one, drawing up presentation slides with accompanying notes. The requirements are trying to get you to produce an answer. And this is the one thing I used to say to my students continuously. Produce an answer that you would be happy to give to your boss or a client. And therefore, if they asked you to produce a presentation, you should produce something that you would be happy to hand over to your boss. If they ask you to produce an article or a letter, you would do so as such. How does the strategic business leader differ from other ACC exams? And I'll continuously pick back up on this. But the key difference is the technical knowledge and the application into a leadership context through a workplace environment and the significant amount of professionalism marks that you can require as you go along. I'm now going to move into the section, which is the practice to pass section, and give you some study tips and exam technique sort of guidance. Um, as I do that, please feel free to fire any more questions into the question panel, and I'll probably review it periodically once I get to the end of this section. Um, looking at the time now, we've been going 45 minutes. From a housekeeping point of view, we will probably break at around maybe half past slightly earlier so we might have a 10-15 minute intermission where you can have a comfort break or grab yourself a tea or, or a drink a refreshment 
Um, at that point as well, uh, I'll let you know what time we'll be breaking and coming back. But for now, study tips. So hopefully, many of you will already be well on your way with the studying because the exam itself is around three weeks away. So here's some study tips that will actually be applied not only to SBL, but hopefully all of your other study. You should refresh your previous papers. And by that, I mean if you have studied your from all the way from the beginning, so I'll call it F1, all the way through to now strategic business leader, you will be assumed that you have retained some of that knowledge, a broad understanding of each exam. And the syllabuses do feed into each other. So within the strategic business leader syllabus, it is assumed that you will still have some retention of knowledge from applied skills, your ethics and professional skills module, EPSM, and your accountant in business module, which would have been F1. Now, if you did and were fortunate enough to receive exemptions, you should significantly recap the syllabus of the prior knowledge that is assumed for you to be able to go forward and study this SBL paper. Planning and the time that you should spend planning. It is my advice and the general advice of most training providers and the ACCA that you will require on average around 12 weeks study plan. So give or take three months to study for any exam and the SBL, given it's the largest syllabus area of the ACCA exams and the largest of the exams, you will need around 12 weeks. So if at this point, and I will be really honest with you, if at this point you haven't picked up a textbook and you think that you're going to be able to scrape through, I would argue strongly that you should significantly consider whether that's how you want to move forward. You want to work backwards from the exam when studying. So the exam is on the 3rd of December and you would be working back, ticking off each week through your study plan. Uh, I alluded to this earlier, do not combine too many papers. Now, I will caveat that it is very much on an individual basis, but more often than not, given that SBL is such a significant size of syllabus and exam, it is not the best advice to try and do too many papers. I'm not saying it can't be done, but if you do too many papers, you may seem that you are overloaded, particularly if you are working at the same time. And as a result of that, you may drown, one for a better expression, in all of the knowledge that you need to retain. You must study the full syllabus. The breadth of knowledge is what ACC are looking to examine. So with that being said, given the size of the syllabus, and its key syllabus areas from a technical point of view and the key syllabus areas from a professional skills point of view, you should significantly consider the full breadth of the knowledge that you attain before you sit this exam. It may be that you are really, really good at strategy, but you haven't picked up the book and had a look at anything on innovation, performance, excellence and change management. And therefore, you're maybe crossing your fingers or hoping that nothing comes up on it. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. The exam is designed to try and cover a breadth of knowledge and therefore it is very much advisable that if you are studying on a study time plan that you lay out your study time plan to try and cover the breadth of the syllabus and you do so potentially like this. This is the typical training provider portfolio for examinations. Um, at Kaplan when I worked there we would often do a tuition phase, a revision phase, and then a question practice phase. Now, we are now in the question practice phase um, for the purposes of our timeline for the December sitting. So if you are still in the tuition and trying to learn new knowledge, you are putting yourself under a lot of unnecessary pressure, and this is why structuring your study is very important. At this point in your study plan, you should really be practicing questions. You should be going through specimen exams, using an approved provider's exam kit, using practice papers, and doing so to time. Because practice really does make perfect. I cannot emphasize how important it is to practice 
doing questions in exam standard conditions for four hours, spending an afternoon or a morning or an evening doing a four hour exam. I'm gonna make a point of this as we go along because in every single examiner's report, which is the report the examiner and the examining team produce after each sitting, it emphasizes that students are showing a lack of practice because they lack stamina to write and produce a quality answer within a four hour time frame. So you must be practicing your four hours two time exam technique. You should also consider how and where you learn best. Some people, and I've come across many different types of learners in my time teaching and in my time as a student as well, because I can draw upon that experience. Some people may learn better in a classroom environment. Some people may learn better on an online environment. Some people may also like to self-study. Now, I would advocate using an approved learning partner to help you with your studying because they can add structure and expertise. But I would also say that when you are doing some form of self-study, maybe complementing the, the approved learning partner through homework, you need to consider where it is and how you learn best. And I've got loads of individual techniques. So for one thing I used to do is I used to actually produce my own revision cards when I was studying and then take them to the social setting and maybe socialize with my friends, uh, maybe a coffee shop or go for dinner. I was obviously the most popular person at the coffee shop or at the dinner. Um, when I was giving them my revision cards and asking them to test me on a model or a theory or a, an international accounting standard. Now, I know it might not sound the most fun thing to do, but I am a big believer and it does really work that if you can integrate your study into a normal part of your life, it becomes a lot easier and people are very understanding of that. So if you do have friends or a partner or family who can support you with this, get them to help you studying as well. Maybe get them to quiz you on your revision cards. And some of you might already do that. The last one, under point number eight, take your real world blinkers off. And a nice picture there of a horse with its blinkers on. The point I'm trying to emphasize here is that this is a professional qualification, which you are all aware of, not an academic qualification. And therefore, having an understanding of the real world pays dividends when it comes to this exam. You must be able to illustrate your professionalism, for example, through commercial acumen, and therefore understanding real world scenarios and real world problems will help you in this exam. Just to summarize each study tip, refresh previous papers, especially if you've had exemptions. Plan enough study time, the, the big average is 12 weeks. Do not combine too many papers because you do not want to suffocate yourself uh, with paper, literally, and uh, metaphorically speaking, because otherwise you will struggle to try and retain all the knowledge needed to pass this particular exam or any others. Study the full syllabus, particularly with SBL. It is a breadth of knowledge that you require. Structure your study, so make sure that you do have a tuition, a revision, and a question practice phase. Also plan in some breaks as well, because you know you don't want to burn out. Practice does make perfect, it sincerely does. You should be considering that you will be doing exam questions to exam techniques in exam times for four hours to try and build your stamina within this exam. Understand how and where you learn best. And I might even add a little bit more to that one. Not only could you learn better in a social context, but you may also learn better listening to music. Um, there is a, a, a few learning theories out there. One of them is called the Pomodoro technique, which is used to try and cram, um, where you get a, a, a timer and you time yourself and then you have regular breaks. That's quite a good one, Pomodoro technique. And make sure that you apply the education or the self-education which suits you best. Take off your real world blinkers because again, this is a, a professional qualification which requires a broader understanding of real world scenarios. So that's my study tips. And now I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about exam technique. 
Um, so yeah, no further ado, I'll, I'll move into this. And then once I've completed this section, I'll have a little look and see if there are any questions in the question panel that I can answer, maybe spend a bit of time doing that. First one, read and highlight the question requirements. Uh, I used to joke with my students um, all around the world, depending on, on you know, I've, I've taught in many different countries. And I would argue the value of a highlighter being very much um, like a lightsaber, that and a ruler, but we'll get onto a ruler in a little bit. The, the value of a highlighter very much allows you to dissect requirements. Do not sit in the SPL exam or any exam, read the scenario, then read the requirements. You should start with the requirements because the requirements will help guide you as to what you are looking for. And we'll be talking about effective exam technique over the next four evenings as well as this one. And I will emphasize significantly how and why you should read the requirement first. Use a highlighter to help pick out the key verbs in the requirement, dissect it based on mark allocation, and then use the mark allocation for things like time planning. You should definitely plan your answer. Lots of students all around the world have told me, oh, you know, I, I, I don't plan. And there's an old proverb and it's, you know, prior planning prevents poor performance. There's maybe a P missing there. But the point I'm emphasizing is that if you do plan and you plan your answer effectively, it makes writing your answer a lot easier. And as a result of writing your answer and producing an answer, using an answer plan, you actually can tell when marking it the difference between students who have a plan and the students who do not. Because more often than not, the students who have a plan actually score significantly higher. When creating a plan, you may want to consider and ask yourself the following questions. How many marks is the question worth? If it's worth 10 marks and another question is worth 20 marks, you would want to spend double the amount of time, and we'll talk about time planning, on the one with the highest amount of marks. But actually, you would be surprised how many students spend more time on a question they like versus a question they do not like and often ignore the mark allocation. So make sure that you use the marks to guide you on your time planning. You also want to consider how many points you need to make. And the rule of thumb, um, we'll, we'll use this as we go along, is that if you get on average two marks within SBL per well-explained or well-developed point related back to the case study. It needs to be valid, it needs to be actually appropriate, and it needs to be contextualized, but two marks per well-expanded, well-explained point and therefore, if you have a 10 marker, you probably want to write around five key points in short, punchy paragraphs. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the next one, what points are there? So you want to take into consideration the requirement and what it's asking of you. And the next one links even better. Which of these are the most important and relevant? Part of showing that you understand the case study is being able to prioritize and contextualize the most important areas that the requirement's asking you. Because you also need to consider the audience. If you were producing a report for a boss or a client, you wouldn't start with the least significant point first. You would actually start your answer with the most important, the most pressing matter, the most relevant matter, and then work your way on from there. How should you structure these points? And this is where the ruler comes in. Um, the ruler, your actual, I cannot stress how important this is. And I'm trying to think of a good analogy. So if a highlighter is a lightsaber, or a ruler is a sword. You must take a ruler into your exam. And you're thinking, well, Alex, come on, surely I don't need one. But the ruler is needed to structure your answer because you will be, by the end of this, producing answers that have subheadings are in an appropriate format. And in order to do that, you will need to underline your subheadings because those subheadings and that structure guide the marker and guide the examiner, which not only leads to more professional marks, but will also lead to more technical marks because 
quite frankly, it will be easier to mark than somebody who has just created an essay format that they may have been pre-used to. What previous knowledge and skills do I have that relate? As I say, it may be that the requirements asking you to produce um, some form of financial analysis. And therefore, you might need to draw on some previous knowledge on how to do a gross profit margin or return on capital employed or have an understanding of payback periods on net present value. Now, you may not have directly studied them within SBL, but you will and should have studied them in prior studying and prior knowledge. And the justification I give to this, because students often go, well, that's not that fair if it's not specifically in every element of what I've studied. And the justification is this. This exam is trying to produce finance directors, managing directors, chief executive officers, trying to replicate a senior leader within a business. And therefore, you would expect somebody who is studying for a chartered accountancy qualification to be able to understand key accounting and considerations. So therefore, things like financial planning and financial considerations, like net present value, like internal rate of return, or even doing some form of gross margin, is what you would expect of a reasonable chartered accountant. And then the last one, which actually I will try and emphasize, if I can, if the highlighter will work, yeah, but it will, the scenario. I cannot stress enough the importance of applying the case study. And you would be absolutely shocked at how many students will produce a textbook answer. And it will be technically correct. So they might explain to me um, what an internal control is, giving a definition and all the different internal control safeguards. And all of it will be brilliant. It will come straight from a textbook, but it will score zero marks because this exam is about the scenario and the exam and the examination team have wrote the scenario so you use it. So, you know, why not use it? Why not actually take advantage of the scenario and apply it to your answer? This is one that relates more to some extent to other exams, but I will emphasize that it can relate to the strategic business leader exam. And I am a big fan of this, particularly around this exam, because you can choose where to start. Now, SBL follows a case study. Excuse me. SBL follows a case study. And with that case study and with the requirements, you often find that there is some form of chronological order or sequence to the requirements. So there is a timeline. And therefore, it is advisable and it does generally lead to more success and higher marks if you do go through the requirements chronologically. But I put this point in here because I'm a big believer of building your confidence. And I want you to finish this webinar, not only this evening, but at the end of the week, brimming with confidence that you can be successful. And so I emphasize that you can choose where to start because you are not marked down by starting with a requirement that isn't number one. And it could be that you get into the exam and in doing so, you see a requirement that A, you love. It might be requirement three, and it might be on internal controls. And you guys, you might love internal controls. So you go, ah, do you know what? I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to start with that question because I know I can do it in the time I've got. So within the mark allocation of time, and I know full well that I can score really highly on it. And then I'll attack the rest or attack, attempt the rest of the requirements and go from there. So I want to emphasize that you can start where you want and you can build your confidence as a result of it. But it may be advisable that you start with question one and work your way through, but it isn't a necessity. <coughs> Excuse me. You can also structure your time. See, this exam is four hours long. And the structure of your time, and we're going to dissect the four hours in the next, well, the next sort of section of this, this presentation. But my general rule of thumb is that for the marks of requirement, you will want to be using the 1.8 minutes per mark rule. 
So if you get a requirement that is eight technical marks and two professional, add them together, so that's 10 marks, times it by 1.8, and that will give you 18 minutes to answer and write your answer down. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, that's, that's what we've done on all the other exams, and if you have, fantastic. But Alex, we've got more time in this exam now. We've got four hours. Well, what I will say is that the general guidance is to spend around 45 minutes to an hour on reading the requirements, then reading the scenario and planning and structuring your answers and doing answer plans within 45 minutes, which then does go back to the 180 minutes, three hour allocation. So therefore, take the mark allocation, times it by 1.8, and that is your writing time. And you will then have around 45 minutes to an hour with a buffer in between for your reading planning time. Be succinct. Some of the people probably thinking, come on, Alex, get to the point. The point is for you to get to the point. And this is what I'm going to say. You are producing an answer that somebody would want to pay for. Sounds a bit of an odd concept. Somebody wants to pay for my answer. Yes, they do. And what do people like? Well, people like reports, memos, all forms of professional communication that are succinct and to the point. If you give me a report that was long and waffly and full of irrelevant information, I would probably stop reading it, particularly if I was a client. I'd be like, oh, right, you know what? I aren't going to read this anymore. It takes too long. What a waste of money. Whereas if you produce something that is short, to the point, uh, succinct, and is relevant, I would be happy to read it because it will take me less time. And I will be happy to give you more marks because you are being more professional. Now, I will emphasize bullet pointing in this exam is significantly discouraged. So writing an answer in bullet point format is not good enough. Being succinct is being succinct, relevant, applied to the case and using the mark allocation to guide you. You should be writing in a professional manner that covers and you would expect to receive if you were a manager, a partner or a client. Structure your answer. I've already talked about highlighters being the lightsaber and rulers being the, the sword. This goes back to actually how it links to your answer plan. The value of an answer plan is it can provide you with your subheadings. So if you, and we're going to do loads of answer planning, so if you see a requirement and you know full well that you want to immediately talk about, um, uh, let's go with the financial feasibility of the investment appraisal, you might decide that you're going to have a heading around profitability and another heading around maybe, I don't know, liquidity and another heading around efficiencies. So these are the ideas that spring to my mind when I talk about a financial appraisal. And therefore, you can structure your answer under different headings. And there's lots of practicing that needs to be done to get these answer plans into your brain. And it might be that you use a model. Not that I want to emphasize models too much, because sometimes students get really over, um, over reliant on a model in this exam. And it's not always necessary. So we'll talk about models maybe separately. But just to add context, subheadings are needed. Ruler, underline the subheading, short punchy paragraphs underneath it, and you will be rolling in the marks and on your way to the lovely 50 plus pass mark. And this actually links back to my next point. You should really be looking to help the examiner and help the mark, and maybe that could add to this little slide as well. Um, you are sitting the exam presumably in December, and in December, it is a festive period, and with that being said, the markers will be marking over the said festive period. So they want answers that are structured appropriately because they are easier to mark. And if you produce an answer that is easier to mark, you will more often than not make them happier, and they will more often than not give you more marks as a result of that. The last point, and one that is genuinely not meant to sound condescending, in fact, it's quite a holistic bit of advice, is to stay calm when you're in the exam. Sounds easier than, well, it's easier for me to say than it actually is to do. And I will sort of try and empathize with you all right now. I 
I qualified around five years ago and I remember sitting every single one of these exams. I started from, from scratch and worked my way through them. And I can honestly say, was I calm in any of them? Um, probably not, but I tried to stay calm, which is maybe what the emphasis is I'm trying to make here. And I did so by preparing properly. Uh, and you're already doing that by being on this webinar. If some of you are watching it back, even, even better still. And if you're on it and watching it back, then fantastic. When you get into an exam, it can be a stressful situation. So make sure you get there early if you can. Make sure you are set up and in a calm mindset. And I used to find little techniques like um, effective breathing would help. And I've had students who do meditation before the exam. Now, I'm not saying you need to do this, but you need to find something that helps you stay calm. Um, and this is something I used to do. And it might not, but I would, I would be disingenuous if I didn't share this with you. Um, I used to get through an exam and at some point take a small bathroom break. And you're thinking, what? In an exam where you've got all this time pressure and you used to take five minutes out of the exam? And that would happen for me. And I've had students who tell me it works for them. And I've had colleagues who I studied with and they used to try and do this as well they would get stuck because their brain was working so furiously trying to think of everything. And then at that point, they'd go, right, let's just take a little breather. And they would write a little point down on what they were stuck on. And they would get up, pop to the loo quickly, pop to the toilet, and then they'd come back. And then all of a sudden, because they were able to just refresh their brain, and they would then be able to start writing again. And you're thinking, Alex, that might not work for me. It sounds ludicrous. How naive? Well, if you are, that's fine. But for some of you, even if for one of you it helps, then absolutely fantastic. Tips for success. Um, very few students enjoy taking an exam, but there are things that you can do to help make the experience less stressful. Now, um, one of them isn't actually popping to the toilet, but maybe I should add that one. Um, you should identify where the exam hall is. If you haven't sat an ACC exam before, you should generally be trying to figure out where it is. And I've had students when I worked at Kaplan who used to turn up at the Kaplan Centre for the exam because they hadn't prepared prior and they didn't realise that the exam wasn't held at the training provider. Plan your route to the exam hall. Consider the time of day, so don't get stuck in traffic. And I know that you're all from around all the world, and I know what the traffic's like in Pakistan, so please make sure that you actually plan enough time so you don't get stuck in traffic, because that will just add to the stress. Have in place a backup plan in case of traffic problems or public transport is delayed. Fair enough. Prior planning prevents poor performance, even when getting to the exam. Ensure you have all the equipment you need for the exam, so a black pen. Um, it sounds crazy, but it still is a black pen requirement, a black ballpoint pen. Oh, and here's an even better one. Uh, loads of students will turn up to the SBL exam without a calculator, which is crazy in my regard, but does happen. And I think it's because maybe they think, oh, well, there's not going to be any numbers in it because it's a leadership exam, or maybe they've not done enough practice, so they've not actually seen any numbers come up. This is an accountancy qualification. There will be numbers in the exam, even if it's a percentage change that you need to calculate. You will more often than not require a calculator for you to be able to do those numbers. So take one. Also, on top of that, take a highlighter, if not a couple of highlighters, and take a ruler. Don't forget to take your exam docket with you as well as your student identification. Oh, wow. There are many students, those who haven't sat an ACCA exam before, where they've turned up without the exam docket or without the necessary ID. And the exam centres cannot accept that student. And that is heartbreaking because that student will have prepared. They'll have gone to the trouble of studying for the exam. They'll probably be really ready for the exam. They'll have done all the trouble, you know, of getting to the exam hall, missing all the traffic and taking a pen and a ruler and a calculator and a highlighter, and then they'll have forgot something like a docket or an ID. Don't be that person. Um, another one about nutrition, eat properly before you leave for the exam. Um, if it's a morning session, you're taking the exam in the morning, have a breakfast. It's a long exam, four hours. Some students might actually feel a bit fatigued, not only physically, but mentally. So make sure you have a good amount to eat. 
Sleep properly. Do not spend the night before doing last minute late night revision. Cramming is not something I advise, although many generations, including mine, became very good at it. Um, you should realistically be trying to relax the evening before. Um, so go to the gym. You know, that's always one that I advocate. And you're thinking, oh, well, that's all right for you to say, Alec. Or go do something you enjoy. You know, maybe you've got a hobby. Maybe it's music. Try and do something the night before that takes the excessive stress out of you and tries to relax you. Maybe yoga. Uh, try not to get into a discussion with fellow students just before the exam, which might come up uh, about what might come up. Again, this will only cause stress. Oh, I've done this myself. I've gone into the exam hall. I've seen people who I've known because they've been studying with me. And I've said to them, oh, what do you think is coming up? And then we all try and guess what's coming up. And then it doesn't come up. And you're in that exam hall. And rather than thinking about what you need to do, you are thinking about what is not there. And that doesn't help anyone. So I'm not saying be rude, you know, we don't want you to be rude, we want you to be nice, sociable humans, but try to not do that before the exam because it only causes more stress. So if you have to sit in your car or you, your mode of transport for an extra five minutes or so, do that rather than engaging with a conversation that would only cause anxiety. In the white box, once the exam is over, relax and do not overanalyze, you cannot change anything now. Um, Students often, when I studied back in the UK, would go and socialise together after the exam, maybe celebrate, woohoo, the exam's done. And then they would start to talk about the exam. And do you know what? That's fine. If that works for you, brilliant. But I remember doing it once and only once, and many of you might relate to this. And if you do, let me know, put it in the question panel. Um, and somebody said, oh, Alex, what did you get for you? you know, question 1A, did you do this? And I've gone, oh, <laughs> I didn't do that. And then you're in a stress for the next six weeks waiting for your, your answers and your mark for your mark to come in. And you're thinking, oh, what, what if I wrote this? What if I'd done that? Try to not engage in activities that's going to cause you additional stress. Uh, this slide is very effective in saying that there isn't anything you can do once you have finished that exam. So let me just click back onto the slides in fact this is probably not a bad time i'm just gonna have a look at the time as well for me to have a look at the question panel it is just a little before 20 past as well so what i'll do is i'll just spend and i will go quiet for you know a couple of minutes i'll have a look at the question panel and i'll see if there's anything there that i can address uh, and then we'll do another short session and then we'll take a break after that so I am here I've not ran off and I'm just trying to use the go to webinar to see what questions I can answer so um, <coughs> uh, Waleed asked a question should we revise previous SBL webinars Waleed it can certainly not hurt my friend so why not um, this or will this be sufficient Waleed um, if I'm all honest the completely straightforward with you uh, how long is a piece of string and it's a bit of a a bit of an idiosyncratic way of putting it. It's a bit of a, sorry for using overly unnecessary comment. Um, it's a bit of a long story. You can use as much resource as you need. In fact, uh, the next section is all about the ACC resources. So maybe that'll help guide you as well. Uh, I've got a question from, and it isn't on there. Uh, it's Godfrey. Hello, Godfrey. Thank you for writing. Uh, sir, the exhibits are matching with each requirement, question mark. Or we need to think twice trying to link the requirement with the exhibits. God, uh, Godfrey, I, I absolutely love that question. Oh, Godfrey, I do apologise. Godfrey, I love that question. It's brilliant because um, sometimes the, the exhibits follow chronologically, and that isn't a bad way of approaching it but what i will say is be careful not to ignore broader reading of the exhibits where you can link more than one exhibit and we will be using we will be talking through two big case studies over the next evening so not tonight but the next four evenings next and i'll be showing you how the exhibits link but godfrey sometimes they will follow chronologically and strictly speaking uh, exhibit one and exhibit two will more often than not be more relevant to the first requirement. But that doesn't mean exhibit six or exhibit four or exhibit three doesn't have something relevant. And likewise, 
question four that you might move on to or requirement four might relate specifically to exhibit four but that doesn't mean you can't apply knowledge from the previous exhibits so thank you for asking that um, do we need to think twice is maybe a little bit strong just think open-mindedly as you go along and think oh actually broader use your commercial understanding Matilda, what a lovely name. Uh, Matilda, I'm just reading your question. Bear with me one second. Uh, oh, Matilda, um, the question I can see, hopefully. Uh, will you take us through the technical content or can you share slides making up the technical content? Um, I won't be going into granular detail of technical content, so I would advise if you need ex excessive technical content, you can download the syllabus from the ACCA's website, and you could also purchase um, a study manual, or um, uh, we used to call them integrated workbooks as well, uh, study material from uh, a learning partner, so Kaplan, BPP, First Intuition, there's lots of uh, platinum approved learning partners out there. Uh, Nasir, please recommend a study plan for us in the short pan of time. Nasir, question practice, question practice, question practice. If you've got three weeks between now and the exam, pick up the exam kit from a learning partner, pick up the past papers and use them as much as possible. Ibrahim or Ibrahim, what to do now if uh, what to do now to pass if the syllabus is not covered yet? Question practice, question practice, question practice. Um, Aisha, thank you for your question. Uh, is it suggested to read the scenario then jump into the requirements? Uh, hopefully, I've answered that. Uh, no, it is suggested to read the requirements, then read the scenario and plan as you read the scenario. I call that like an active plan an active read because when you are reading the scenario after you've read the requirements you know what you are looking for yeah of course you can use highlighters uh daniel thank you very much you can use highlighters in the exam um i think it oh i've gone too far let me go back uh, Farhan in, in capitals, how to plan your answer. We will be doing lots of planning, uh, but it will be covered consistently uh, tomorrow and the next four evenings, Farhan. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Hi, Alexander. Thank you for calling me on my phone. You can call me Alex or Sir. Or, in fact, I prefer Alex more than Sir. Um, Waka, you've been very Waka Ahmed, thank you. Uh, hi Alexander, what if you underline without a ruler when it, it looks fine without it? Honestly, take a ruler. Um, I don't know, I can't see a reason why you wouldn't want to take one. Hell, I've got one in front of me now and I don't really need it, but it's just here, just in case I need to structure an answer. As uh, a question, uh, here we go. Abdul Qadir, wonderful question. Uh, if I need to write, there we go. When doing an answer plan, sir, would I need to write the answer for each question in full sentences before starting answering questions or just writing bullet points would be enough to go ahead answering the question? Um, right, let's get this absolutely nailed down. Um, uh, oh, it's, uh, let me see. Actually, it wasn't. It's, Abdismadad, I do apologise, it was Abdismadad Salah. Um, so I'll ask the question again. When uh, when doing an answer plan, uh, do you need to write, write out the, the answer for each question in full sentences before I start answering the question? Your answer plan can be however you want. So you might choose to do key headings um, and a few bullet points, but when you are writing an answer, make sure that you write it in continuous prose. So therefore, it needs to be written in a professional format. Bullet points is not good enough to get enough marks to pass this exam. It needs to be written in a correct format. So it isn't just short. It needs to be succinct and to the point with enough information in there relying back to the case. Uh, 
Uh, Ankit, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll answer your question broadly. So you're asking about specific models like um, the Kaleidoscope for um, Bolnagun and Haley. No, I will not be going into granular detail of individual models. In fact, I will emphasize the fact that this exam does not require you to know everything about individual models. The amount of students who used to emphasize and get so stressed out about knowing every single porters, what an Ansoff's matrix was. Um, you know, I need to know everything about SWOT or uh, a particular model around change management. Yes, the models are there. They do help to some extent. They are very academic, but models are not essential. They are there to provide a structure if required. You are much better at providing and applying professional judgment. So I won't be going into individual models. Ah, brilliant, uh, there we go. Mushtaba, can we write answers without using models? Yes, you can, and I would love it if you did. Thank you very much. John, uh, will we be looking at past questions during this webinar? John, yes, we certainly will. Yep, uh, Waleed, we will be covering different formats. I'll be showing you how to produce slides. I'll be showing you how to produce reports. Um, so that's a good one. Hi, every time. Um, let's read this one. I think it is from Erica Seeley. Thank you very much, Erica. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Is ev Hi, everyone. Oh, I like how you address everyone, Erica. Can I comfortably say that if I am faced with a 20 mark question, I can safely develop 10 uh, 10 points, uh, safely develop 10, start like, why am I going backwards? Uh, 10 points to gain 20 marks. Um, Erica, I'm not going to try and, you know, hang my career on this, but, but yes, if you, first with a 20 mark requirement, it might depend particularly on the verb. Um, it might be that you get three marks per well-developed point with a recommendation. So it could be that you need to produce even less points. So I would just try and do more practice and get used to the type of requirements and mark allocations. Waleed, will we be covered? Uh, will we cover formats in these sessions like preparing slides? Yes, I think I've already answered that one. It would be very helpful if we could have a list uh, down various models, info is required to structure answer. Uh, Mohammed, uh, Fakan, oh, Fa Fa oh, Fakan, hello Fakan. Um, I'm going to say no, if I'm really honest. I don't want to emphasize the necessity of models because there are so many models. In fact, there are over 80. What I might do, in fact, I think I can, um, is provide you with a game that I created um, when I was at Kaplan. And I can always provide you with the link, which will give you maybe a bit of a test on all the models. But if I'm if I'm being really honest now, I've said that I'm slightly dubious to do so because it will then overly focus the necessity of models, which is completely not the idea of what I'm trying to get across. So I might just share it with you individually. Um, if if I do feel by the end of it is necessity, I can go on and try and help you there. Uh, how can we know what models to be used for a particular part in the question? You don't necessarily need a model, but there are also many cues. Um, for example, the question might ask you to produce a macro environmental analysis. And through my experience and practicing of questions and studying and teaching, I know that that would probably be quite good if it was produced in a pastel format. Or you might be asked to assess the market attractiveness of, for um, Coca-Cola to enter the, I don't know, a different new market in the UAE. And you might then decide to produce uh, a, a model answer around the Porter's Five Forces. But again, it comes through practice. Knowing which models generally comes through practice and the cue. But you do not need to answer all questions using models. What else have we got on there? Right then, guys, there's loads of questions, which is brilliant. What I'm going to do is I will actually take a little break now because it is half past, as, 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 uh, as stated, and I will review the questions over the break. So we'll take 15 minutes, which is fantastic. And um, 
what I'll do is I'll just exit these slides so you can see that we're on a break. Ooh, there we go. So break from half past, and we will be returning at quarter to. If I can spell. So yeah, I'll see you at quarter to. I'm going to put myself on mute and freeze the screen. I am still here. Um, and I'm just going to try and sort of collate any of the questions when I come back. We'll engage with those questions. And uh, thank you very much for engaging so much so far. It does make this experience completely more enjoyable.
Evening, ladies and gents. Uh, just three more minutes and we will kick back up. Uh, hopefully nobody's ran off yet. And I've just been going through the questions in the question panel and I'll try and address them in a bit of a, a, an order. All right. Right then, ladies and gents, hopefully you can hear me again. Um, and if you can't, just tell me. So no message in the questions panel will allow me to assume everything's all right. <laughs> and then uh, if, if I get a message saying, that's not gonna work, is it? <laughs> yeah, there we go. Welcome back. That'll do the trick. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. So before I move on forward through this uh, tips for success, onto the ACCA resources. Uh, on that break, I spent 10 minutes just having a read through the question panel and I was lucky enough that I was able to enlarge it so I could read them properly without breaking through. And I've just pulled out a few key points. Now, the first thing I will address, and we will address this continuously, is the lovely models. Um, there are about 80 plus that are what I would call, I don't wanna say, there's 80 of them, <laughs> and 80 if not more, and with that comes a lot of structure to your, your, your education, because that's how we used to learn them. We used to go, here's an Ansoff matrix, apply it. Here's a Porter Spy Forces, apply it. Here's a Balridge model, apply it. And the reality is, is that that doesn't happen in the real world. And so when we created the SBL exam, we wanted to move away from the P1, P3 mentality of learning a model, and applying it, what we wanted to do was emphasize the need that you can prepare a professional answer by engaging in professional skills from a leadership context 
and therefore knowing every single model is not essential and students still like to lean on the model for a bit of comfort which i don't blame them for but it's not essential to answer every question and we'll go through the examiner's reports where it emphasizes that some students will try and force a model into an answer and make a complete mess of it when in fact they would have been better just to have used professional judgment the next one i want to cover is i wrote these in a bit of an order was the game that i mentioned and um, i will i will share it um, it was something I created um, when I was at Kaplan, and it's quite fun. Uh, there's a few tongue-in-cheek things in there, so uh, I will caveat that it is given in my personal capacity, not as a professional, and it is maybe just a fun way for your knowledge base, but certainly not something that you want to rely too much on. Um, there is no room in this exam, or this next point I'm making, uh, for rote answers you shouldn't be producing something that you have read in a textbook in fact it would probably be scoring you zero marks because the answer should be related specifically to the case a uh, bit of admin yes it has to be a black pen not a blue one uh, somebody asked around the number of requirements in the scenario and in the, in the actual questions there isn't a specific section so there's not section one section two there's not one big question and two small ones or a 50 marker and a 25 marker the requirements can range anywhere from you know 20 marks all the way up to 30 marks 40 marks there isn't a fixed amount of sections or fixed amount of scenarios so one exam can have five requirements and the last exam i believe had three in it's very liquid um how many lines per paragraph so a little bit of a sort of guidance on what you should be writing in terms of length again it does depend on the requirement the verb the scenario so i would advocate not trying to you know write an answer that has two lines per paragraph or three lines per paragraph and i'm going to be able to tell you how to structure um, an answer using uh, get to the point answering why and expanding so we'll be talking through that over the next few days but what i will say is that long waffly answers are nowhere near as good as short to the point punchy answers and then I'll just finish on this last one, which was about planning. And you should plan effectively as you are reading the scenario. So if you read something in an exhibit and you're like, oh, that relates to requirement two, you can write next to it, requirement two, and use that as guidance. Some students will plan more effectively than others through their, their background or their prior education. And I would advise doing a small answer plan per requirement rather than doing one massive answer plan for the entire script so hopefully that's answered an array of questions i will move forward now um, because well you know we're getting on uh, acca has a plethora of study support resources and it is something that i am massively proud of um, something that I think is a brilliant service to the students. Uh, not only do we offer these, you know, practice to pass webinars for many, many different papers, but also we have so much on our website that you are able to access. So we've got our website and I will share the links. In fact, they're on the presentation and you go to study support resources and you can go through onto the SBL section. And in there, you can find your syllabus and study guides. You can find the examiner's article, which you have to read. Um, it is, it's a, you might as well say that this is like reading the examiner's mind. And with that, obviously, as wonderful as that could be, it's as good as telling you what you should and shouldn't do more so than I am. You can also find the specimen exams, um, which are specimen papers, which are exam standard created by the ACCA examining team, and you can practice them. And there are a plethora of other resources like um, PDF files and handouts. Uh, we are going to go through some of the examiner's reports so we will be going through the last three examiner's reports and there are also videos on there and you can see that video is only seven minutes you could have watched that in the break if you haven't already and that's a video um, on the examining team guidance so you can see that there is a considerable amount of resources 
and you can find them on the study support resources section. And what I will add is that they are not only available just for SBL, they are available for every single one of your exams. So if you've got any friends or family or you have any colleagues who are also studying the ACCA qualification and they might be studying, I don't know, tax, there is a section on our study support resources website for tax. There is a section for business accounting, every single paper. So have fun trying to go through these resources. And I am going to go now through what I would refer to as one of the most concise and brilliant resources that was created. And I used to use this all the time when I was teaching at Kaplan. This is the how to approach the strategic business leader exam. And it looks a bit like this. In fact, it doesn't look a bit like this. It looks exactly like this. Now, for the purposes of my presentation and to make it more enjoyable and easy to follow, I have broken it down. So I have taken snippets and dissected it per slide. So hopefully you will either have this. You can get this from the resources on the webinar right now, or you maybe already have it. You might have already seen it, which you have is even better. Time management. In fact, it's quite apt that that is one of the first sections in this lovely one pager. Um, you should spend at least 40 to 60 minutes on reading and overall planning. And therefore, that equates in my quick maths and the way that I do this is 1.8 minutes per mark. And that's technical plus professional marks. If you were to say, because there is 100 marks in totality, you would therefore times that 100 by 1 1.8, that would give you 180 minutes. So that's three hours, which gives you a buffer of an hour to do your reading and planning. Now, that is best case scenario. And so because I give you or I advocate sticking to the 1.8 minute rule, um, you sometimes find that you will be left with a little bit of exam time to spend on that last question or going back to tidy up another question or another answer and therefore stick to the 1.8 minutes because that is the best practice. How to dissect a requirement. Now this is requirement one and it links back to time management. And the point I am making is that this requirement overall had 18 marks. And you wanted to go through it. You are a non-executive member of a ch and a chairman of a nomination and corporate governance committee. Great stuff. But first off, and I'm being really harsh here, I don't care who I am. I care how long I need to spend on this requirement. So when I pick up my exam script, and I open it up and I go to the requirements first, I look at the mark allocation, I times it by 1.8, I write 32 minutes next to it, and I do that for every single requirement. Obviously not 32 minutes, I times the requirement by the 1.8, so I know how long I should be spending on that question when I am writing the answer. Hopefully I've emphasized that enough. If not, I'll emphasize it again. Um, effective reading and planning. You see, you should read the case background and understand the organization and review the list of exhibits to understand what extra information is available. Read and annotate the requirements to identify what you are being asked to do. And this A to G then talks more about what specifically you might want to pay attention to. So your role um, is often an important thing to consider. So that will depend, that will have an impact on how you answer. So if you are a member of a nomination committee or a, you know, a non-executive a non director compared to, I don't know, an audit assistant or a, a senior manager, that will all affect how you're expected to answer. The format requirement. So if they have um, asked you to produce a report, you should realistically know how to produce a report to, from, date, subject, title, and then you go into the report. Uh, if they've asked you to produce a memo or even an email, um, you should know how to produce these. And you can see that in the um, illustrated article, which is part of this also, part of this presentation, the importance of effective communication. You should also consider who you are writing to. And I touched on this earlier. Your audience is extremely important. So if you are writing to the board of directors or to the public, you will want to consider what information they should and should not be made aware of. 
if you're the board of directors, they can be made aware of sensitive internal information on the performance of the business. But you might not want to address the public with such information. So continuing to understand who you are writing for. The verbs. Now, I did see a question asking about the verbs. And to be quite honest with you, we will be going over the verbs, which is fantastic. But we might not cover them all. So it is a case of if you see a verb as you're going along and you see it, maybe you're doing your own practice, just ask in the question box and we can look and try and address that. But, you know, the evaluation verb is, is a bigger, higher level, more critical verb than maybe something along the lines of discuss. And that will differ to something along the lines of which you don't often get, which is define or explain. Part E, mark allocation. You should note down the time allowed and the number of points you need to make because the marks will guide you accordingly. Professional skills, because again, you want to know whether you are being assessed on scepticism or commercial acumen or evaluation or analysis or your communication skills. And then the last one, and there's a reason it's last because it's the least important, any model or framework that will help you identify the points which I will caveat to say, you may not need a model, you may just use your professional judgment, and likewise, you are better to not try and force a model into an answer. This is how I dissect a requirement. I'll highlight it up. Now, I appreciate that I've got the luxury of being on a computer here, so, you know, there's a, an element of, of tech, technology here that's a bit different, but you might want to take a couple of different colour highlighters. And I have highlighted key information. So we are the non-executive chairman, non-executive member and chairman of the Nomination and Corporate Governance Committee. So before I even read on, I know that I am an NED. So that means I need to be impartial to the business. I am appointed on behalf of the shareholders and therefore I am not performance remunerated. So I should really be considering the overall wealth of the shareholders in terms of their well-being of their investment. And I am part or the chairman of the Nomination and Corporate Governance Committee. So I know that the Nomination and Corporate Governance Committee, well, their job is in relation to the succession planning of a business. And so that might be part of my role. And so I want to consider the composition of the board. And the Corporate Governance Committee, well, they're concerned with the overall oversight of the business. So I want to be looking at this from a very high level. Then there's the little walkthrough. The recently appointed chairman of the Railco Trust Board has requested for you to provide him with information related to the governance of Railco and the roles and responsibilities of a non-executive director. Amazing. You are, are going to be producing something for the chairman. That's your audience. So as a result of that, you want to be writing to somebody in a very senior position and your language and your style of writing should suit that. What do you have to produce? Oh, look. You are asked to prepare a briefing paper, not an essay. So therefore, your briefing paper needs to be structured appropriately with a to, from, date, and maybe a bit of a subject. It needs to also have subheadings, short, punchy paragraphs, and does not need to contain superfluous waffle. So you should be producing a briefing paper. Fantastic. I know what a briefing paper looks like. I can get into the actual requirements. Section A, what are the verbs? Identify and explain the agency relationships of the parties in real code. OK, so first verb, identify. So that wants me to find them, which is a very low level verb. So I would use the agency relationships as a bit of a guide. So I maybe use those agency relationships as my headers and explain them. So explain is a very low level verb as well. So you want to give um, instruction or uh, an expansion to your chairman of what the agency relationship is and maybe the direction of that agency relationship. And then this lovely green line, and I like doing this because it really does emphasize that even though it's an eight mark part A, it's actually broken down even further. When you see an and in this sort of context, so you've got the first verb of that part of that requirement, then an and, which is discusses, uh, or gives you a little bit more of a, an, ex, an expansion on that, do, do apologize. The and you want to draw a line through. Uh, I often tell my students that's like the dash. So you've now got a second part of the same requirement. So the second part of the same requirement, A, wants you to discuss the rights and responsibilities of those parties. 
So therefore you have eight marks for technical knowledge plus two professional marks for the communication skill. So therefore I know that part A is 10 altogether. So I'd want to spend 18 minutes on that in totality. I would want to find probably four agency relationships because there's eight marks. I would want to identify and explain each one and then discuss which means you know you can give a bit of an overview of the argument it doesn't need to be specifically in in detail it doesn't need to be textbook it can just be related back to the case of Railco and discuss their rights and responsibilities if I do all of that in a communication format therefore in a briefing paper I will get 10 marks so hopefully you can see my logic I've pulled the requirements apart I've used the mark allocation for time and also guidance on how many points to make. And that's not even the best part because the best part is the next one. B, assess. So therefore you're giving an assessment, the role and value of a non-executive director to the board of Realco as a public sector company. Now that is six marks. And then there is an additional two marks for an evaluation skill. So I would be looking for around three to four key roles and values of an NED but this is what I'm going to say just writing those roles and values doesn't really get you very far it's got to be entwined in the case study of Railco and it's got to relate specifically to the public sector so therefore you want to use your evaluation skills at the end of it to give a conclusion so that's how I dissect a requirement. Now we will be looking at an answer plan for this requirement tomorrow. So if anybody wants to ask, you know, how would I structure an answer to this? I will show you tomorrow. But this was just the emphasis of your role, reading and annotating the requirements, the format, the audience, the verbs, mark allocation, professional skills. And you can see, look, part G, any model or framework, I've just got you 18 marks. And if you got 16 of them, you'd be very proud and I haven't used a single model. Moving on, as you are doing your active read, which is reading the requirements before reading the case and the exhibits and then searching the scenario and the exhibits for the most relevant information, you should identify links to the tasks at A. You should annotate and highlight the key points and add notes to your answer plan, which is very, very much in line with what I've been saying. Uh, planning and completing each task. So you should review the requirement for the keywords, which I have shown you how to do very briefly, and we'll be spending a lot more time doing that for the next four evenings. Uh, make sure your plan has identified and answered the format, the headings, therefore take a ruler, and the brief notes and the points that you want to include. So you should take in consideration the format, headings, and make brief notes, and structure your answer and use it as a guide. Perfect plan improvise, prevents even poor performance, and your plan will definitely help you in the SBL exam. Last little point within, within this lovely little one document. Um, when writing up your full answer, one or two sentences should be sufficient for each mark. The article Professional Skills Marking Guide and the read demand of the SBL marker illustrate what is expected by the marker. And when writing up your answer, you should be succinct, apply the case, get to the point and then this last one is the so what effect and this is something that I have tried to drill home consistently with all my students whenever you write something and I'll try and think of an idea off the top of my head so um, let's go with uh, let's use an internal control weakness as an argument um, uh, we'll, we'll make up a fictitious company financial training college um, has a poor internal control system as a result of an ineffective staff ID card. Okay, so you found an internal control problem. So what? What's the effect of the staff ID cards not working properly? Well, as a result, people can walk into the centres without showing their ID. And again, so what? What's your point? Come on, get to the point. Why is that a problem? Well, as a result of that, theft and fraud has increased because people are able to steal projectors. As a result of that, that has an effect on the costs of the organization, which in turn has reduced profitability. Oh, wow, that's the point. That's why it's a problem. And therefore, that's why I should do something about it. So every time you write something, you want to be considering the so what. 
how does that affect my profits? How does that affect my costs? How does that affect um, the key points within the case? It might even be something a little bit softer, like the organizational structure. But every time you write something, you want to be considering, so what? Keep going, keep going. And as you do think, so what? If your answer doesn't actually you know, give a clear point, you need to keep expanding on it. I like this little speech bubble here just underneath. Remember the right, well, remember that the right practice and confidence in your exam technique will lead to success. This is a candidate from the first sitting in September 2018. And I really like this. And it might sound better from them, but I can't do a different accent. So I'll just stick with my Northern English one. My advice is to do lots of exam technique practice. I wish I had done this sooner. I was too focused on learning content when the exam is a lot about application. So keep practicing. If you haven't started practicing now, get started. Use the specimen exams, use an exam technique, um, use, sorry, use an exam kit from an approved learning partner and try and practice as much as you possibly can. <coughs> Excuse me, the last point, further insights are given uh, in the article, 10 things to learn from the SBL September sitting. And also there is a webinar for the specimen exam 3D group. So you've got plenty of resources which could all be found on the ACCA's website. So I'm just about to move into the next section of the examiners or the, the presentation this evening. And this is my way of emphasizing the importance of the resource, which many students will and do overlook. And I hope full well that after this evening, you no longer overlook the examiners reports because they are as good as telling you where students went wrong last time or the time before that which in my opinion is as good as telling you what the examiner is going to do going forward, because we often find that if students don't perform very well in one sitting at a certain thing, they will then potentially put it in the next exam to try and see that students are improving and the quality of the student is improving as we go along. So just bear me one second, I'm just gonna get set up. Right then, so hopefully we're back in the room. So if I just click through, um, this will be the first one that I talk about, which is the examiner's report from March 2019. They aren't the largest of documents. They range around six pages, and some of them are actually quite spread out. So, you know, it's not a huge amount to read from page to page. But I have taken the liberty of pulling out what I want to emphasize, and I've also done a nice summary at the end. Um, to try and really bring home the importance of reading these. So although we're doing an overview now, it doesn't stop you from reading them. What I will also say is maybe on this webinar, we've got people who are doing a reset, and you may have sat the exam in question where the examining team and the examiner have wrote the report, and you might get a little bit of enlightenment out of these reports as to where you potentially went wrong. They start with a general overview. Now, this relates to March 2019, and in the pink it states, strong candidates both integrated and used the relevant case study exhibits throughout their answer, as well as selecting appropriate syllabus knowledge to support the applied points they were making. And then it goes on to say in yellow, weaker candidates used pre-learned knowledge as the basis for their answer and did not integrate or apply the case study material adequately. It starts with a general, general comments. Now, I like this because what it does is it kind of um, vindicates what I was saying earlier. You need to be applying the case study and those who scored well did apply the case study as well as syllabus knowledge. But those who did not score very well used learnt by rote knowledge, which is not what this exam's around. As it goes into further, uh, more general comments, candidates must also spend sufficient time planning and their answers should have logical structure, be balanced, cover the most important points, not have superfluous waffle in there. And I'll give you a bit of an Englishism, but I'll go into that. And then avoid unnecessary overlaps and duplication. I will continue to tell you how important planning is, and I'm hoping that you're getting the point. But if you aren't, the planning of your answer will take 60 seconds per requirement if you are 
prepared for this exam. It's not a lot of time. And with that, you can continue to evolve the plan as you read the exhibits and you read the scenario. You want to use a structure to your answer and therefore the plan will help give you structure. And that will help guide you with the most important sections. The superfluous waffle comment, and maybe I'm guilty of that myself in some instances, but it's an exam where you want to try and get to the point, not give lots of overly academic um, textbook knowledge into the exam. In fact, it's not very much advised that you do repeat anything. So things like definitions or an explanation of a model is not worth any marks. Rewriting the answer, and we see this all the time. If you rewrite the answer in your exam, you are wasting your time. And I don't, I don't, I shouldn't be so strong, but I don't want to see you doing that because you are spending time copying out something we already know. When we are marking these, these scripts, we know the requirement inside out. And therefore we know when it says 1A for that particular requirement, we know what the question is. We don't need you to rewrite it for us. Oh, but Alex, I like to do it because it guides my answer. No, stop it. You're wasting valuable time in the exam. You don't need to do that. You can have the actual requirement in front of you and you can answer it using your answer plan. As we move forward um, in, in blue, there was evidence of a shortage of time when answering the final tasks and answers tailed off towards the end of exam. And they also showed that there was a mismanagement of time and people ran out of stamina. Now, I talked about this a little bit earlier, and this is why it's extremely important that you attempt a full mock. And I know you think, well, Alex, where am I going to find four hours? Well, you find four hours on an evening or you find four hours on a weekend or you find four hours in the daytime if you're look, looking to have a job which is flexible, because that four hours will get you ready for the intensity of a four-hour exam, and you won't be the ones that the examiner's talking about, because you'll have done plenty of practice, and that four hours in reality, if you really think about it, is just a morning at work, or an afternoon in the office, or an afternoon at a client's, and if you were to spend four hours, and I know I've done it today in the office today at the ACCA, I spent four hours and in the blink of an eye it had gone. So that four hours might actually not seem too much of an arduous task to get into the practice of doing timed exams. A little talk, comment now about technical marks, and I do think this will add a little bit of value because you've all been asking this. Up to two technical marks are very often available for well-developed points. So what does that mean? Well, it needs to evaluate the significance of the points, use the information, and this is particularly related to the case of the case back in March was on a company called Smartware. So if we were to be more generic, using the case study talks about the consequences of the company. And this is where I talk about my so what, so what, so what, if you think about the so what, you can then keep expanding your answer and then supporting the points made with relevant examples using the case material. That could get you up to two marks for a well-developed point. A little bit now on professional skills. The format requested by the intended recipient will be supported by an answer that is presented clearly with headers throughout your answer. Wow, let's just stop there. Headers. So that's why we need a ruler. I'm not going to say it again. I probably definitely will say it again. But just for emphasis, headers are needed. And is short, focused sentences and within paragraphs of three to four sentences. Wonderful. So for those who are asking about how long these paragraphs should be, three to four sentences, there it is from the examining team's mouth. Um, you also need to understand the target audience. And that goes back to making sure you address them if they are the public versus if they are an internal stakeholder, somebody of seniority versus a subordinate. As you move forward, it goes now to talk about specific questions. So in March 2019, so only you know a few sittings ago at the beginning of the year, question 1A, one of the comments was, with the minority of candidates, I'm just talking about now in the pink, with the minority of candidates using all three, but doing so, um, which made their answer very long and repetitive, and then this approach took the disproportionate amount of time to complete with the results of their answer to question five often being rushed and incomplete. So this is a good example of where models go wrong. Question 1A in March, um, many answers used PESTEL, which is a model which you're looking at macro environmental analysis, used Porter's five forces and some used SWOT. 
You could have answered this question without using any of them. You would have been best placed to answer this question might be by using one of them with elements of the other. But the reality is, is that because people were so confused and trying to use the models, some people tried to use all three and spent far too long and had huge and significant amounts of overlap. So try to use your professional judgment before you use a model. Uh, moving on to 1B, and if we look at the part in blue, however, some answers were quite, I'll start that again, some answers were quite general and did not always refer specifically to smartware. So always refer back to the case, and then the point in green, which relates to a Tara model, which is all around risk management. Um, green, simply stating that there was a particular risk that should be avoided, uh, but no further explanation as to what the action might be taken to achieve this. And the Tara model, and I, I won't need to give you a huge overview of this, is a risk management model using four big, broad strategies for how to manage risk. So you can transfer, accept, reduce or avoid based on two axes, which is uh, impact or probability or impact um, or severity, and then probability or likelihood. And you map the risks using this. But the reality is, is that that model is just used for you to generate ideas. So when answering question 1B in March 2019, the answer to avoid a risk because it's got high impact and high likelihood is not good enough. If you are doing a risk management type of question and more questions than risk management, you need to be specific and practical. How on earth would a company avoid any risk? Well, they could cease that business activity. Um, they could move to a different market. They could um, potentially sell the, the area of the business that is causing them a significant amount of risk or outsource it through licensing or even get somebody else to deal with the risk for them instead. So the reality of that is that using a model hasn't helped them there. The model should just be used to expand the plan. Moving on to March 2019, question 2B, one of the key problems is that people were producing lengthy detailed essays explaining a porter's diamond in great detail, however, are failing to apply it effectively to the question set. So again, we've got loads of students who are really clever and they're brilliant at remembering what a porter's diamond is. And for the benefits of people who are thinking, what on earth is a porter's diamond? Well, a Porter's Diamond is a model that can be used to explain a nation's competitive advantage. And it takes into account four key factors all around the diamond that are interrelated. Now, you may know what one is and you may be able to explain from the brilliant textbook that you understand it. But unless you apply a model, if it's asking you to do so where appropriate, you are not going to score many marks at all. So case application is more important than knowledge of models. Uh, question 2A, in yellow, the best candidate showed more skepticism and questioned the likelihood of the possible turnaround of Noria. Now, that's quite a nice one. So they're talking there about skepticism, and it links perfectly back into questioning. In blue, failing to answer the question with a key issue here. So failing to answer the question with a key issue here, Kay. many candidates spent a significant amount of time explaining why the store may be failing rather than discussing the implications of it closing down. And this maybe is a point where I'll, I'll talk about actually answering the question. Lots of students, and I'm sniggering and, and unintentionally because lots of students will write an answer for the question they think or want to have been asked. And I'll just let that sink in. So they think, oh, I've got a question here that I, if it was slightly different, I'd be able to answer. And this is why it's important when you do write your answer and you do write your answer plan is to just readdress the, the requirement um, on, a, on a regular basis, just to ask yourself briefly, am I actually answering what is being set here? Question three and four on this slide, so it overlaps nicely. Question three, many good candidates used common sense structure. Ooh, common sense structure. And the structure they used, issue, outcome, recommendation, which tends to um, lead to a good and easy to mark answer. I love that square bracket. You see, it emphasizes the point where I talked earlier around making the life easy for the marker. If you do produce an answer, which is logical, has common sense to its structure, 
you are more likely to score higher marks. Um, some people are giving the same generic solutions for each risk. You do not get many marks for any type of requirement, particularly risk or control based questions for repeating the same point. So you saw earlier there was a question where it said avoid. Well, that's not good enough. And here they've gone with uh, staff training, tightening of internal controls was not actually enough. You need to be saying how. OK, why? So what? We produce staff training. So what? how would that reduce any risks in a business? OK, tightening internal controls. How would you tighten the internal controls? Be specific. Question 4A in blue, one of the key problems here was the answers were far too general, although technically correct, and had not specifically applied the case. Again, don't need to emphasise that. Um, question 4B, all SBL candidates will be expected to have passed the financial management exam. Um, and therefore, it goes back to the point where I made around prior knowledge. If you were exempt from financial management, or you sat it a long time ago, you should seriously consider getting a little bit of a booster on financial management, because ultimately, what would you expect a chartered accountant to be able to understand? And you would expect if you walked into a finance director's office, or you were dealing with a finance director, or a senior auditor, or a, you know somebody in, in a very senior position, in a leadership position, for them to understand how to manage finance. So therefore, understand things like net present value, internal rate of return, payback, and other investment criteria. Uh, in the red stain, the obvious was not developed enough and therefore wouldn't score enough marks. Coming to the end of March 2019, question five. So you can see in this exam, there was five requirements with many subsections. This was a lovely requirement. And I, I'm a little bit sad here, and I might try and sort of change the tone of my voice to try and emphasize this. They ask the candidates to produce slides. Amazing. Produce presentation slides with accompanying notes, which in my opinion is a gift and a dream. And you can attack it from any way, shape or form. But this is the simplistic way of doing it. Draw two boxes, because if they asked you for two slides or they asked you for four slides, draw obviously the accompanying amount of boxes. And then within the boxes, put your answer in a bulletproof format as if you were giving a presentation at work. So you would have the key points and you would have them prioritize the most important points first, working your way down. And then underneath that box where you have got your title, headings and bullet points, and it doesn't need to be a lot of bullet points, just a couple of them, you would then go in and underneath it, give the notes, which is just a simple expansion. So what you would be expected to say for each one of those bullet points. I would love that as a requirement for any of you, because I sincerely believe it is a very effective way of showing that you can communicate, but also a very effective way of scoring a lot of marks. Now, the problem was, is that students spent too long um, we emphasized here in yellow, due to poor time management, people didn't get onto this requirement, they lacked depth, and they might have overly repeated themselves, and again, ran out of time. It was 1.8 minutes per mark of writing time. Stick to that, you will be sure to get onto all of the requirements, and therefore you will be sure to spend the appropriate amount of time ensuring you cover the breadth of the paper. It is statistically easier to score more marks by attempting more questions. Sounds common sense, but you wouldn't believe how many students will spend a lot of time on question one and then rush the rest of their answers. So that's March succinctly and sort of quite nicely summarized. And as we move forward again, we're going to be looking at June now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, what I'd like you to do is look for the patterns and we're going to I'm going to do a summary of them towards the end after I've gone through June and September's. What I will say is one of the bonus points of now having four sittings within ACCN of many, many positives. But one of them is the additional insight that you can get from the examining report. So we get more information than we ever have because there's more exam sittings and therefore we get more examining reports that we're able to dissect. Um, in June, which is nice to see, strong candidates integrated and used the case study material throughout their answer, whereas weak candidates did not integrate or apply the case study material. Wow. 
perhaps that sounds like nobody read March's 2019 examiner's report, or maybe they just didn't use it. Uh, often answers fail to make sufficient reference to the exhibits. It's a shame because somebody in the examining team at ACCA goes to the trouble of writing all these exhibits, it's their job, and then they go to the trouble of linking it all through the scenario. Read them because they are fantastic and they will help you answer the actual requirements. More general comments. Candidates are strongly recommended to take a mock exam before the actual exam under exam conditions to get used to the challenging demands and concentration, thinking, writing and organisation of time in a four hour exam. Please do it. I think everybody at the end of this five days, even if not you know, tomorrow, should really have a go at having a, an attempt at a four hour exam. I mean, I'm telling you, you need to do more than one, but many people won't even do one. And then they get into the exam and it's like, oh, wow, it's actually quite difficult to, you know, do this for exam. So just give yourself a give yourself a, a fighting chance and have a practice. Uh, moving on and moving on on a nice way as well. Um, we've got yellow and blue. So technical marks, however, using technical frameworks unnecessarily uh, as the basis for structuring an answer led to many candidates into forcing their answers to fit the frameworks. And then in blue, candidates are often better off. Or, or, yeah, candidates are often better off using different elements of the task requirement as the basis for the order of their answer. So don't try and force your um, your need for a model. Just get on with it and um, use the requirement more than a model, and make sure that you actually answer the requirement as you move along. Excuse me, just making sure I can click through to the next slide. Um, ooh, professional skills, and this one starts with undoubtedly. Undoubtedly, the most alarming feature of this sitting, so only in June, was the inappropriate turn of some answers. This is very concerning, tactless, rude sometimes as well, and this was exasperated by the fact that the directors, whose limitations were, the, were being criticised, where the recipients, so they were the audience of the documents candidates were being provided. Candidates need to be polite in their language, stating weaknesses in an impersonal term, backed up by justification. Now, in June 2019, the answers of some candidates were very unprofessional, and you, well, you want to take a point whereby you emphasise that you wouldn't disrespect a client by telling them abruptly that it was all their fault. You wouldn't disrespect a client by giving advice that they need to be fired. And yet some people were doing so. So bear in mind that you will be giving a position, uh, maybe a position as a professional advisor, to individuals in the audience. And in this instance, it was the actual board of directors. And you may need to discuss their downfalls. And in doing so, you need to do that in a professional manner. Task one in June 2019. The first task asked candidates to produce a briefing paper for the board meetings, which discusses the weaknesses in, in the composition and operations of Five Oaks Board and recommends improvements. It required the demonstration of communication skills, which is really nice to see because strong candidates linked aspects of the board's composition and operations to the governance best practice and the problems relevant to Five Oaks identified in the exhibits in an integrated discussion. Now, I think if I could cut down and pull out the key bits here, this is just an example of strong candidates using the case and exhibits. Uh, the other significant professional weakness in the task was poor format of the answer. Candidates who produced long, headerless, oh wow, headerless, all right, you might need a ruler, um, headerless paragraphs with multiple points in them were not using the briefing paper format effectively to communicate and therefore scored, scored low professional marks. So another, another tip of the hat to the necessity of structure. As you move into task two, task two was a memo. Oh, wow. So they wanted a memo in task two that discussed the commercial and ethical issues involved in publishing a book in its original submitted form. The book had errors and had unreliable evidence. It required scepticism skills to be demonstrated in pink or red. Candidates who organise their answer under separate headings of commercial and ethical issues often produced a balanced answer. Fantastic. So they used the answer to guide how they, sorry, they use the, the requirement to guide and structure their answer, fantastic. However, 
Many candidates structured their answer using the Tuckman's framework. This was technically incorrect. And it's an example of really bright, intelligent people knowing that they know a model and forcing it in unnecessarily. In blue, a more serious problem was the twisting of the situation to fit the Tuckman's framework. Don't do it. Uh, if you're considering not knowing what a Tuckman's framework is, it is a model used to justify ethical decision making. Um, with five different elements, five different questions in it, ranging from profitability all the way down to environmental impact. In this instance, it was inappropriate. You could have used two headings. Uh, one of them would have been commercial issues and the other one being ethical issues, and then maybe subheadings underneath for the each individual issue. Professional marks are strongly correlated to technical marks in this part. And to be honest with you, they are strongly correlated throughout. And I mentioned this a few hours ago. If you score highly with a good, well-structured answer on the technical side, you are very likely to score highly with the professional marks as well. And you could, for an argument's sake, and I have said this before, often refer to the professional marks as quality marks because if you produce a good quality answer, you will score those professional marks. Task three. This task was a section of a consultancy report to the board which assessed the attractiveness of an acquisition target, a competitor in the area of academic and professional publishing uh, called Pendine Publishing. From Five Oaks viewpoint using financial and non-financial relevant information. Okay, so it wants you now as a task to not only think as an accountant, but think as a more broad stakeholder, maybe from a director's point of view or a consultant, because as accountants, we are very good, naturally, at understanding whether something makes a profit or makes financial sense. But commercial acumen, which is the professional skill in this requirement, also should really consider non-relevant or non-financial relevant information. So you might want to consider things like customer satisfaction, staff satisfaction, and other variables, which are also KPI related. The main weakness was that this task, uh, for many candidates, appeared to be answering it, was to demonstrate why the acquisition of Pendine or Pendine, sorry, will be attractive rather than assess the attractiveness of pending. So they were trying to answer a question that wasn't set, emphasizing the need to go back to reading the requirement when you are answering it, asking yourself, actually, am I answering what was set? As we move forward, I appreciate now some of you might be a little bit dozy, dropping off, it's getting late, so I will try and just sort of engage you again. Um, in, in yellow, weaker candidates just listed features in a SWOT analysis and did not explain the benefits of Seven Oak. And in blue, failing to draw a conclusion or providing a conclusion. And it's always very much a necessity when you are assessing something that you provide a conclusion or at least a summary at the end of it. Uh, task 4B, the task required candidates to recommend to the board how Five Oaks' current digital platform can be further developed to attract and retain customers. Commercial Ackerman again was asked for this one. In blue, in blue, uh, in pink, strong candidates were clearly linked to increasing engagement and interaction with customers and obtaining more data about customers and the requirements. And the emphasis here I want to make is they were using the case. In uh, yellow, using a six eyes model, um, which relates to the, the marketing of an organization uh, and twisting the scenario to fit the answer was a weakness. So therefore, forcing a model again is something that is not advocated. Making recommendations that are vague, you must also be specific. And making recommendations which were ethically questionable. Um, this is a leadership exam and as a chartered accountant, it is expected that we follow our fundamental ethical principles. So ethics underpins everything that we do and therefore it is not appropriate to give an answer which is ethically questionable. Uh, task five. Um, so I'll just actually jump into the, the actual highlighted part. So there were some very good candidates in task five, although there were signs of lacking planning uh, and generally poor exam technique linked to that lack of planning. In green, candidates must remember that this exam is designed to mirror the workplace, which I really do like that they've put this in this um, 
June 2019 examiner's report. Uh, if you were given a task by a chairman at work, but ignored his instruction that was given, their future prospects might well be adversely affected. And that's just a polite way of saying if you don't do what the boss tells you to do, or you ignore them, you probably aren't going to do very well in that organization. And therefore, why would you not actually answer the requirements in a task is a workplace environment in your SBL exam? Now, the last exam, some of you may have already done this exam. In fact, some of you might have done June, some of you might have done March. So if this does relate to you, hopefully you'll be able to gain a lot of value out of it. Um, and I'm conscious again that, you know, this is slightly repetition, so I won't spend forever going into granular detail. But here we go again, general comments, strong candidates integrated and used the case study, fantastic. Ooh, and then this part's are slightly different to the other two. Um, it gives you guidance from the examining team and shows that candidates had not necessarily read the examiner's approach article, the importance of effective communication, or done any past exam papers or specimen exam papers. Therefore, here is a guidance from the examining team on how to approach the RT or how to approach this exam. And here is the importance of effective and communication for SBL. Both links are on this presentation, uh, which you can download right now. Or you can go onto the website and put it into Google and find them on the ACCA resources page. Read them. Oh, and that's where you find specimen papers. I saw a question earlier, which was where do I find real code? This is where you'll find it. It's specimen exam paper two. And that's what we'll be doing for the next two evenings as well. Oh, here we go. So this is good. Um, candidates should spend sufficient time on planning to ensure that their answers are structured logically, balanced, covering the most important parts, not padded out. And it's called this superfluous waffle previously, but now they've changed it to not padded out material that it does not address the task requirements as it scores no marks. They should not repeat themselves, so therefore not making the same point twice and do not overlap. Uh, in yellow, quality of some candidates' answers tailored towards the end of the exam, so it shows that many candidates were struggling to deal with the actual pressure of a four-hour exam. And in blue, candidates are strongly recommended to take a mock exam before the actual exam under the exam conditions so that they get used to the demands on their concentration, thinking, writing, and of a four-hour exam which is required. If we move forward, um, a little bit of overlap here, technical marks addresses the requirement and the task covers the scope of the requirement in, uh, in pink, and that was in pink, sorry. Uh, it takes into consideration the questions, the verbs which are indicated, so it's, it's essential they look at the verb. They want to apply the organisation, its environment featured in the case study, so this is great stuff. Uh, we're specific to the decisions or situations covered in the task requirements, so be specific, and showed why the points being made were significant, significant in the circumstances described. And this green one here is my way of saying, so what? You need to, again, expand on your answer as you go along. So, so what? Why have I written this? What's the implication? Up to two marks are available for well-developed points, and we can skip through that now. Uh, many candidates had clearly thought about the professional skills, which is very enlightening to see. What it shows to me is that candidates were improving now uh, and attempted to present their answers in appropriate format. So the message is becoming clearer. We don't want long university style essays. We want professional briefing notes, papers, reports, public addresses, um, letters, all forms of public publication and communication. Uh, the recipient would have helped by answering the presentation structure clearly with headers throughout the answer to avoid long paragraphs and repetition. The irony is I'm repeating myself, so we will continue to move forward at a little bit of a quicker pace. Some students answered the question very well with clear structure, well presented and clear focus. But there was an inappropriate use of a model called the Porter's Five Forces model um, or a SAF model. Wow, stop forcing models into answers you do not necessarily need to. For those who aren't familiar with the Porter's Five Forces, it is a model used to assess the attractiveness of an industry, um, and you could potentially get value from it by considering things like barriers to entry, 
um, the threat of substitutes, the power of buyers, the power of suppliers, and competitive rivalry. But having said that, you may not need to use that Porter's five forcing model. And knowing it doesn't necessarily get you any marks. An SAF analysis is something which looks at the investment appraisal more often than not, or an evaluation of a strategy. And S stands for suitability, A stands for acceptability, and F stands for feasibility. Not a bad model, to be honest with you, and one that is generally done quite well if needed. Moving into question 1B, um, the, the examining team extremely disappointed with question 1B, in particular any financial analysis. And then this goes back to my point in yellow, where you should be familiar with calculations and financial management. Future candidates of SBL are reminded that they may well be asked to undertake calculations within the examination. Therefore, you need your calculator and must ensure that they are familiar with the financial techniques and methodologies referred to in the FBS, SBL syllabus. Uh, question 2A, many candidates answered the requirement very well, which is positive to hear. Most answers were well structured in an appropriate tabular format, although some answers, so moving into the blue, had clearly not planned and were therefore very messy and difficult to read. It's really sad to see this, that people aren't getting the message that planning really does help. Uh, in green, format plays an important role in presenting the general professionalism in SBL and this point here. Bullet point answers gain very little credit in SBL, so therefore bullet points, if you can avoid them at all costs, please do so, because you will gain very little credit. Uh, moving forward, firstly, most candidates did attempt to present their answer in a slide with accompanying notes. Fantastic. However, often uh, in yellow, who provided either slides only or notes only, and some presentation, I'll start that again, and some who presented in a non recognizable format at all. Um, I don't mean to sound condescending, I really don't, but it's very straightforward to produce a set of slides in an exam. You draw a box, you put a heading in a box. You put a few points and then underneath you write the notes of what you would be saying to say. Um, right, and that's another reason to take a ruler in because you can then draw the box perfectly. Candidates are again reminded that the presentation in the requirement format is an important aspect of being awarded a pass mark for professional skills. Take the easy marks, guys. Question 2B. Um, weaker candidates answered all three sections together and I've seen this time and time again. So the types of requirements where this happens is where you would see uh, question 2B, section 1, section 2, section 3. And they, they, um, they annotate and show you this by having an I, another two I's, and then three I's in brackets like Roman numerals. Do not answer all those sections in one big answer. Use the subsections of a requirement to structure your answer and gain the most marks. Candidates who took an approach where they presented everything together was unclear, confused, and therefore did not actually answer the well on professional and didn't score well professionally. Those who gained the highest marks for demonstrating skepticism were those who considered the opinions of the financial director. And the last question, I believe, in yeah, it was the last question in um, in September's exam, which was uh, three questions in totality, <coughs> is unfortunately the one that the exam paper where candidates performed the worst, which is not nice to hear. And it goes down to maybe, and I saw this in the chat panel earlier, in the question panel earlier, uh, many candidates not actually understanding what the Balridge model was, which is fair enough. It is quite a performance excellence model, but it was given to you in the exhibits. So this is a, a gap in your general knowledge of the syllabus, and this is why it's important to study the breadth of the syllabus. Many candidates simply did not read the exhibit, nor the requirement clearly, as they interpreted the information in the exhibit as a wish list. Uh, rewrote the information from the exhibit with no attempt to consider whether the actions described met the performance excellence criteria. I appreciate this was a difficult question, but again, it's the last question in the exam you should really have been prepared for it with the 1.8 minutes per mark and a good study plan before you get in there. Now, I will, before we move on, ask you this. Have you noticed any patterns? So what I'd like you to do is in the actual questions panel. Oh, no, we're giving all away the answers. Don't see that. Um, 
maybe write up a few things that you've noticed. So anything that weak candidates have done and anything that strong candidates have done. And I'm going to give you what? How long will that take? I'm going to give you two minutes um, and that'll be perfectly fine. So two more minutes um, and I will wait for you to throw things in the actual question panel. So I'm going to put myself on mute. I put myself on mute and I put myself on mute too quickly. Two minutes. Did you notice any patterns? Put it in the question panel. So far, I'm not going to lie, Laura, you are my favourite person so far. So thank you very much. Oh, we've got a few more coming in. I do apologise. Oh, that's it. Fantastic. Cheers, guys. Just a few more, well, just a few more seconds. We'll go 30 more seconds of some great things getting thrown into the question panel. Keep them coming. Oh, I'm back in the room. So I can see an absolute phenomenal response. And I am sincerely grateful of that. Um, what I will just add is that I've done so many webinars taught in many different locations and the interaction you get on these webinars really do make it more valuable. So everything you're writing in here, I've had a quick flick through um, and I'm just going to summarize a few of them. So again, thank you everyone who's wrote in the question panel. So I see that there's quite a few people saying, you know, not applying the case or not integrating the case. So when you say that, that gives me a lot of value um, and a, a, lot of, a lot of encouragement. Uh, not considering the requirement as we go on to address the task in real life. Plan. I love the word plan. Uh, thank you. So not actually applying the, the plan. Prior planning prevents poor performance. So thank you very much. I, I like this one as well. Um, scattergun approach to answering questions. Otega, um, that's a really interesting way of putting it, but it's another way of saying they don't plan, they just answer everything and then they get into a bit of a mess, don't they? Fantastic. Otega, you've also wrote about poor time management as well. Uh, Sonika, lovely, strong candidates focused on case rather than the actual textbook knowledge and models. So that's another really good bit of insight. Uh, fatigue, John, thank you very much. Fatigue, people running out of time at the end, not doing enough practice. Um, Abdul Qadir, uh, taking advantage of the res uh, taking advantage of resources given by such an examiner's report was again strengthen the candidates where we candidates failed to do so. Guys, you've done a brilliant job. Uh, Aisha, just want to point out yours as well. Turn of communication and the overall writing because you are the overwriting. You've got to make sure that you are communicating effectively, and that's where that report will come in really well. Um, Oh, Waka, yeah, lots of people rush at the end. It's very sad to see when, in fact, they probably have a good enough knowledge, good enough level of education to be able to pass if they've only just planned their time out a little bit more. Thank you for everyone. 
Um, Gil, lack of practice and exam techniques. Sounds like we don't carefully read the requirements and just rush the answers, and I know it's uh, frustrating. So thank you, everyone, for writing in there. Uh, I will show you my summary, and there's lots of overlap. In fact, to be honest with you, you did the summary for me. Um, just bear with me one second. So here's the patterns that I've noticed. Weak candidates do not integrate the case study and use the exhibits. They don't use the exhibits. You must apply the case and the exhibits. Um, brain dump superfluous waffle. I quite like the phrasing of that. The rote learning is not appropriate. And you cannot just scattergun approach, as, uh, as it was rightly said a moment ago. Um, show signs of poor time management, running out of time and not planning, lack the stamina. This is a four hour strategic professional exam. And many people do not develop their points. So we talked a little bit, uh, particularly in the March paper, where there was quite a lot of risk and not actually saying how you would go about expanding on that. And I've wrote so what in capitals to emphasize that when you write down an answer, when you are structuring your answer and you're writing your sentences and you're thinking, have I answered the requirement? So what? All right, fair enough. Keep going. If you don't, don't answer the so what, you haven't got the mark yet. Poor structure, format and presentation. Would you be happy to give your answer to your boss if the answer is no, you will score low on professional marks and probably score low, score low on the technical marks as well. Weaker answers also um, answered the question they wish that had been set and did not carefully read the requirement. Forced a theory or a framework model and twisted the scenario to fit it. Don't do that. Repeat the same points and copy the scenario. Repetition of points does not score more marks. In fact, once you have made your point, move on. Do not repeat it. Do not write in an appropriate turn. This is a professional exam. You must write as such. And therefore, if you are addressing a board of directors, do not insult them. Do not insult anybody in a professional context. But more so, make sure you know who you are creating the report, the answer for. Lap, lap, <laughs> I'll start that again. Lack of depth in knowledge of the syllabus, prior syllabus areas like the applied skills knowledge, and there's been quite a lot said tonight about financial management, is assumed. Make sure you're up to date with your financial management. Make sure you're up to date with your applied skills level. And even if you get exemptions, you should really be considered that you understand and have a breadth of knowledge. And the last one in the weaker candidates did not actually use the ACCA study report, study resources, uh, study support resources, when in fact they're brilliant. They're generally brilliant and they can support your learning. So please do use them in the links there. On the positive note, not everything's bad news. Good, strong candidates used the case study and supported it with the exhibits and therefore, scored well, were precise, succinct and got to the point answers were appropriate and specific. They managed their time effectively and therefore answered all the requirements. Loads of these reports now are saying the last question, whether it's question three, question five, the last question of the actual exam is more often than not the poorest answered. I do want to stress that you don't need to do it in chronological order if you don't want to. Now, I'm not saying you have to listen to that, but some students might look at question five and think, oh, wow, a presentation slides. Alex has told me that they're actually quite straightforward. So I'm gonna do them first and get out of the way and score good marks and stick to my time allocation. Moving forward, should signs of prior exam practice. Many students will be doing lots of practice, particularly at this stage where there's three weeks to go for your exam, keep practicing, two time in exam conditions and then produced well-developed points up to two marks per which per, per well-developed point fantastic keep the marks coming in good structure format presentation had a lightsaber in the exam and a sword i'm being a little bit sarcastic but use the ruler and the highlighter to help sublight prioritize sublight subhead prioritize and address the appropriate audience I do apologise. Um, moving on, strong candidates answered the specific requirements, carefully read the question and, and make sure that when you do write something, maybe even just your first sentence, you can flick back to the requirement, just glance at it and go, yep, that's answering the requirement. I am answering the question set. Good candidates applied frameworks and models only if appropriate, using the case to direct their application. Good candidates moved on after each well-developed point, ensuring no repetition to maximize marks. 
Strong candidates wrote an appropriate professional turn as if someone would pay for their answer had a, and drew knowledge on a breadth of syllabus knowledge recapped from the applied skills level, for example, financial management. And the last one, the little holy grail, strong answers used ACCA study resources. We have five minutes left, and in that five minutes, I will do and close off with a summary, as well as give a little bit of a talk about what we're going to be doing this evening. Uh, time flies when you're having fun. Can you believe we're nearly done our full three hours? I sincerely can't. Um, so yeah, it's, it's come on really quickly. So I did my introduction. I'm Alex. Hopefully you all know me a little bit more. Um, and I look forward to getting to know you all a little bit more as we progress over these five evenings. Um, please do. You know, be as be as personable as possible. It's it's always more engaging. Um, we have talked through the strategic professional level, and I did talk about the EPSM module. Make sure that you do the ethics and professional skills module. It's like saying that something like that. I mean, come on, it's going to help you with your professional skills, and therefore, it's going to help you with your SPL exam. We then talked through the practice to pass. I went through an array of study tips which could be related more to other exams as well. Uh, I went through an array of exam techniques which were specific to SBL and again good practice for other exams. I talked about how to approach the SBL which was that lovely one page document. If you've not got it already make sure you have a read through it. It's very effective and maybe pin it up in your room or in your office and just keep it to an eye so it keeps in your brain. And lastly, I talked through the examiner's reports, the last three examiner's reports, and if you feel like you want to read more of them, there are more available. So, the next part of, of this session, this practice to pass, is the walkthroughs. And in order for you to get the most out of the walkthroughs, you are going to need to understand what the case studies are. Now, I can't afford, as much as you know, it would be an easy job for me, but not necessarily the most enjoyable one, to sit here tomorrow evening for over an hour while you all sit and read the case study. The most appropriate thing for me to do will be to tell you to read it beforehand. So you should realistically read Specimen Paper 2 Rail Curve. If you can't find it, it's on the ACCA website in the study resources, study support resources called Specimen 2. Print it out, download it, put it on your tablet, do whatever you want with it, read it. Read it before tomorrow evening because it will really help to add value to what we are going to do. The exam is a significantly sized exam and it has a, an introduction uh, and the introduction is over one page. It's got five requirements, and the five requirements range with different roles and different tasks, subtasks, and we are going to dissect each one of these and approach it from how we would actually do it in the exam. It's got six exhibits ranging from a website page, uh, a newspaper report, an extract from a passenger survey and competitor analysis. Uh, it has board meeting minutes, uh, the Chief Executive Personal Specification, which is really good because you get two CVs and you can kind of get excited about that one because you try and decide who should get the job as a Chief Exec, which is a really good one. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And then Exhibit 6, which is analysis of fraud, which then leads us to think, well, actually, we can be sceptical and show our analysis skill within our professional context. I'm coming to a close, um, and I'm going to do so by doing what every lovely accountant likes to do, which is to tick off part of what we've done. We've done evening one. We have gone through the SBL level, uh, SBL paper. Uh, we've talked about the strategic professional level, and we've gone through all of the introduction section and all the way through to the outline of rail curve. In the green spotted line, we are going to do an exam walkthrough for the next two evenings, which is very, very, very effective way of learning. Uh, we are now at 10 p.m. in Pakistan time, and that is the end of this evening's session. Um, I am going to just spend a conscious moment or two, because naturally there's always questions at the end, to ask you if you have any questions. 
um, and I will pull them up. I might not answer them all straight away, so give me a moment just to look at the question panel. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate um, the thank yous. It's always very nice. Um, uh, John, uh, just to sort of for the benefit of everyone, because I really like what you've wrote there. Uh, John wrote, I will try and sit the exam specimen to exam before the webinar tomorrow. John, with all due respect, I um, I wouldn't. You know, it's a lot of pressure. If you have the time, wonderful. But if you, at a minimum, and this is for everybody, just read the scenario, read the requirements. You do not have to have attempted it. So, John, don't put yourself under too much pressure. But if you do, if you've got the time, wonderful. Uh, everyone, with regards to the WhatsApp group, it's not something that I can administer um, due to GDPR rules. Um, so unfortunately, I won't be able to do, but there's nothing stopping you guys taking it forward and creating your own WhatsApp group. Uh, thank you very much for the for the lovely, lovely messages. I uh, look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Uh, Nasir, sir, if you could December 18 highlight with June 19. Nasir, I'm not sure what you mean by that, my friend, but the highlight exam uh, we will be going through on evenings for four, uh, four and five. Right, guys, um, lovely to meet you all in inverted commas. Um, and and again, you know, if you do need anything, just maybe get in touch with me tomorrow when we're actually logging on. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to shoot off now. So thank you again. And um, I look forward to dealing with you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.